All right, well, I guess we'll get started. Um, so welcome to uh, the spring workshop that's put on by Waukesha County and Wisconsin Land and Water. My name is Leif Hauge. I'm an engineer at Waukesha County's Land Resources Division. This is our 24th annual stormwater workshop. I presume pretty much everybody that's tuning in uh, likely listened yesterday, so I won't uh, go through all the stuff on housekeeping that I did previously, but just a few reminders. Um, uh, the presentations that you're seeing will be posted as PDFs on our website, or all or most of them will be. Also, uh, Wisconsin Land and Water is recording these presentations and following the workshop, you should receive an email that will include a link to the YouTube channel that those are posted on. Plus it'll also include a survey that we'd like you to fill out. And uh, if you would like to receive PDHs, professional development hours for attending, uh, please complete the survey and then Wisconsin Land and Water will send you a certificate. Uh, I'm gonna be giving a background in each presenter uh, if you have questions, please put them on the chat at the bottom of the screen, and I'll be monitoring that. And at, at the end of each presentation, I'll relay those to the speaker, and uh, hopefully we'll leave a few minutes for Q&A at the end. The Q&A button, not to confuse things too much, is we'll be using mainly just for internal communications and logistics. Um, I'm going to turn my camera off while the uh, presenter is talking, and then I'll turn it on back at the end, and we'll uh, go through the, whatever questions have come up. Um, so the first speaker is Carrie bristol Grohl. Carrie received a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from UW-Milwaukee and has been working in stormwater engineering since 1994. Carrie began her career as a stormwater engineer for the cities of Milwaukee and Brookfield prior to founding Stormwater Solutions Engineering in 2002, SSE was acquired by Aquilus in, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Carrie. In April, 2023, Aquilus's engineering division is located at the Global Water Center in Milwaukee and has a team of 10 professionals designing stormwater, green infrastructure, uh, water quality and flood control practices for municipal transportation, water agency and private clients. Carrie's also the inventor owner of the patented rainwater harvesting device, Storm Garden. In her leisure time, Carrie enjoys all outdoor activities of camping, hunting, motorcycling, kayaking, gardening, and hiking with her two German shepherds. Carrie and her family recently completed a two-year-long renovation of a former restaurant bar into their home. So um, Carrie's going to be doing a presentation on a citywide green stormwater infrastructure plan for the city of Green Bay. So... Carrie, thank you very much for attending and I'll see you in a few minutes. Note to self that when you submit a bio, only submit the words you want somebody to actually read. I always think they're gonna go in a printed document and not be actually read all that. So sorry about that lengthy uh, bio, but good morning everybody. And thanks for joining us at 8.04 on a somewhat gray and crappy morning. Uh, what we have to talk about, I think are some great things today and um, hopefully I can start it off here. Uh, with some great stuff. So this is a green stormwater infrastructure plan. Uh, otherwise, you know, locally, we re really refer to, to, to GI, green infrastructure. Uh, so I'll just refer to it as GSI. This is, this is what the city of Green Bay preferred to call it. Um, you already heard the background of who I am and that stormwater solutions engineering was acquired by Aqualis a year ago. Um, Aqualis is a national company, and so I just wanted to give you just a teeny little uh, brief view on what they do for one minute um, so that you understand uh, Aqualis has uh, a national approach to looking at stormwater and water conveyance and restoration and maintenance and added us as their engineering services division a year ago. So now we're taking care of our local clients as well as across the country. So the purpose of this plan, and Melissa Schmitz from the City uh, Resiliency Office would have liked to be here, but she had other commitments today. She and I um, really worked closely on this project, uh, is to provide steps toward flood and climate resiliency and water quality, guide the ID and tracking of GSI projects within the city. Right now they have very few and they wanted to make sure in the future when they started to have them, they have an organized approach of going forward. 
uh, reduce flood risk and provide water quality improvements according to their TMDL. Prioritize an actionable list of GSI projects. So uh, where this really started was a few years before um, the city had a couple of city staff people had brought a porous pavement project forward to the Common Council. And their council members at that time uh, stood up and said, before we start spending money on these things, we'd like to know if we only have a certain bucket of funds, where is the best place to spend that money? So let's take a look at the entire city, do a full plan on where it could be utilized the best, and then make sure that we have a strategic plan and going forward. And then create a process and a framework for implementation. So that's not just a plan, it's placed on a shelf, like we always say, but how do they continue that uh, for years to come with their existing staff? And then ensure that that applies or ties in with other programs and goals. They have a few other um, initiatives that are going on in the city of Green Bay right now that they wanted to make sure all these things tied together. So we will be talking about each one of these things. I'll just throw them on the screen and you can skim over them. And using, uh, some of you will recognize some of the materials that we're going to be using because a lot of them are available from Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewage District free for everyone to use. Many of them we have uh, created or helped to create, so um, even easier to be able to reuse some of this stuff. But I like to think in each of these projects as kind of building on the shoulders of giants, or, uh, building on what's already been done so that our efforts can be spent doing something more and better and not having to reinvent the same materials that everyone has used. So especially when something is available from MMSD and we've gotten their uh, head nod and go ahead and use this material, you'll see some things that you might recognize if you're local to Milwaukee. Uh, first thing uh, with this project was to hold a big stakeholder meeting. Uh, really was more of a workshop. It was three hours at the city uh, offices. We had probably 25 people there uh, including a couple of aldermen and the mayor for the full three hour meeting, which I think is really important because you need to have buy in coming from the top. If this isn't supported by your leadership, it's not going to really be given much but lip, lip service by the rest of your staff as well. So first question was, what do you consider GSI? And you heard from one of your speakers yesterday that like a wet detention pond is not really considered GSI or GI by many communities because it doesn't infiltrate. And I think John Linder brought that up about Madison. Uh, similarly, you know, there is uh, gonna be a needing to def define what GI is or what GSI is for your community. Some communities think that a wet pond is green because it's green, because it has vegetation. So that is something to walk through. So we we talked through all of the potential items. They chose everything on these screens to be considered GSI. And then another topic of our workshop was where you could consider GSI to be useful in the need for it and the locations where you're going to place it. And so through the uh, through the day, we had a survey at the beginning of the day and a survey at the end of the day to see if anybody's opinion had changed on some of these topics. But where do you actually need GSI? Uh, they decided, and this was the final, I think, survey for the day, in areas where there is flood, uh, historic ponding areas, roadways that are ponding, backyards that are flooding, things that are causing problems in the community. Understanding the difference between stormwater ponding and flooding is we're not going to probably make much of a dent in the Bay of Green Bay Lake elevation or you know, riverine flooding that's coming out of the banks. But yet we can make a difference when there is um, a conveyance issue within the sewer shed. So that would be their top place to, to have these located. And then where there is high pollutant loading uh, in order to meet DNR's TMDL, there is also uh, the you know other water quality issues that they've experienced within their waterways. Uh, to reduce costs of storm sewer upgrades, and so if we could see the impact of climate change on their local flooding, um, could we create additional storage within the system so that, you know, bigger storm sewers aren't needed or more inlets aren't needed, but instead, instead of adding more great infrastructure, we add green and it saves them money in that location. Um, and then you can see the rest of these uh, areas kind of, kind of fall down the list, but they're still there. They're still considered co-benefits. We talked about all of them. 
uh, even things that are not on the list, like potentially adding, you know, jobs in the community. We And along with that, what you're not seeing here is where, um, this is for the need, where, where should this stuff be placed? Once we decide we have need, where should we place them? And so we rated areas um, from, you know, areas of uh, near flooding, uh, outfalls of storm sewers, um, maybe near a school or a park where some educational component could be built into it in areas of lower than average property values <clears throat> was another one. Uh, and so there is a real long list again about where uh, the location of the things could be placed. And using the outcome of the where something should be placed, we looked at uh, various levels of GIS and we, we teamed with REL from uh, Green Bay because they have local information and they helped us with the GIS on this project. So we took the outfalls uh, data from the Winslam modeling that the city had done previously and put uh, associated that with every sewer shed and then gave them kind of a, you can see the rankings here from low to high in a, in a heat map more or less, and then laid that out across the entire city. So every single sewer shed has a storm sewer outfall, which has a Winslam model with has this data, and so that went into the GIS uh, effort on both TSS and phosphorus. So this shows us the areas of the city that maybe would have the biggest potential for creating worse water quality. We also added in every neighborhood uh, so that when the city has, uh, the city has a revolving lo uh, loan fund. If you were interested in putting in a rain garden or rain barrel or some other type of um, private property GI, GSI, you can apply for a revolving loan from the city and they wanted to be able to map that. So if somebody from Seymour Park shows up, they are in this darker color, more of an interest in letting them uh, receive that revolving loan because they're gonna be helping overall. Then we took every instance of known flooding or ponding. So these had been phone calls that came in for the, the police or fire department during rain events, um, private property complaints, you can see a lot of them, the blue dots are not right along the river. They're up in the sewer sheds a little bit. Uh, there are a couple that are right at the water body that maybe we aren't gonna be able to impact, but some of the ones that are further up into the sewer shed are really what we are looking at. We also had their capital improvement program and we added every one of the projects to that exercise. So now we can see where we have water quality overlaid with flooding issues and then where their CIP falls in. And that gives us an idea of maybe some of the early projects that could be going out that might help attack both the water quality and flooding as well as already be an area where they're gonna be working in the next few years. You have a project, you have a roadway project, you're gonna be putting in curb and gutter or putting in new roadway. Um, this is a place where it's, you know, it makes sense to get out there. We also did some additional mapping to look at the lower property values that we mentioned before. So if we have a neighborhood that has a need for a facelift, a need for a little additional funding to come their way, uh, I, it makes sense to us to be able to put a project in their neighborhood. Um, where there is proposed development, where we know we have maybe blighted um, old buildings that are gonna be going through a facelift as well, that that would be something that, you know, there's gonna be an obvious project here. There may be a parking lot replacement, maybe a forest pavement project, that type of thing. And then some impediments. So if we have soils that are not gonna be conducive or that are, so we have both clay and sandy soils in that community. If there is a sandy soil area, it maybe is a better and more preferred area for GSI versus clay. And then where do we have high groundwater, high bedrock, uh, slopes that are greater than 6% that we just wanted to try to avoid. So that helped us to kind of zone in, figure out areas where, especially where the CIP projects are, um, we know there would be an interest um, for doing some work in that area. And if it coincided with all of these other um, GIS maps, we think we have a winner. So our staff went through uh, and the city had asked for 30 public and 15 to 20 private GSI locations. So this is what's different between I think this plan and, and any others that we have participated in 
uh, we were um, we did half of the work on the KK watershed, Kinnickneck watershed GI plan a number of years ago, where we really looked at what was a good idea? How could you make relationships and try to make things happen, but not really a specific project you could put into the ground next year? Uh, and so where we went a lot deeper with this plan is let's look at what the city can actually do in the next five years to get this moving. And so we we created a sort of concept plan for each of the sites that we found that would be a good location. We calculated the gallons of capture. A lot of these uh, community type projects want to see flows in gallons or storage in gallons rather than acre feet or things that engineers are used to, to using. And then how many pounds of both to total suspended solids and total phosphorus are captured in this device you know, on a conceptual level? It's a bioswale, it's porch pavement, it's um, suspended tree system or regenerative stormwater conveyance, that kind of thing. So we created a more or less a sheet like you're seeing on the screen and um, you know, laid out all the information. And you can see that we, we really dove into a pretty um, deep level where we even got down in with topography down to the level of where a bioswale or porous pavement could actually be placed because of its low point, because of the proximity to inlets, that kind of thing. We looked for obvious utilities that may be a constraint. If there was a water main on one side of the road, knowing the DNR standard on separation from water main, we'd try to stay away from that. Uh, similarly with you know a lot of power or gas lines or what have you. And so then we would actually show a block, a blob on a screen of where that bioswale could be located. Now it would be the time for the staff engineers at the city to take this as a part of their CIP project and then put the design into practice. So do they know where they're going as far as that is concerned? We helped them a little bit with that as well. We also created a GIS map that uh, anyone with the link can access. And uh, sometimes when I try to access it on a presentation, it doesn't really come back to this. So hopefully we, you know, hopefully this works out okay. Because then I have to pull another screen over and uh, let me know if you can't see the GIS on the screen, but we'll zoom in and be able to see that each one of these 50 locations has a little marking. And for each one of these, we'll have information on this is a permeable pavement project. We are saying it's highest impact because it falls in line probably with the CIP. Mm -hmm. There we go. And then uh, we have, if, if you cannot see this, and I'm talking to myself over here, uh, this will be available in the PowerPoint um, presentation. There is a link in the PDF that you'll be receiving as part of the class today. It's but readable, then, Carrie. Okay, good, thanks. Um, each one of these has a lot of details on what is the size, how many pounds of TSS are we capturing, how many gallons, what's the drainage area, kind of all of those higher level inputs that we were providing to that design staff. And then this is available now for them when this project gets built to update this to what the actual numbers are for the physical structure. And then this is also the spot where they will start to consider maintenance long-term. So to put in um, additional uh, information into the database about when does this need to be inspected? When should it be, you know, maybe some sediment removed from a bioswale that's in a median, or maybe the porous pavement needs sweeping at certain intervals. This is a way for the city to stay organized on the maintenance that comes long term. So this is a really important part that we felt was so kind of awesome that the city had this um, vision to before they really get into a program kind of put themselves in a spot where so many people usually are involved in that. And now if it's all being managed in one GIS where a, a you know report comes out to tell them that there's maintenance needed on five of these devices this year, it really gets them uh, much ahead of the game. Also to note the total present value um, construction cost, capital capital cost of all of these projects comes up to about $20 million. And then we estimated the annual maintenance to be about $300,000 at that full build out. So with the 50 devices, 
um, $300,000 a year. And we're using that information when we get to the next part, which is uh, triple bottom line. So everybody wants to know, what am I getting for all this money I'm spending? How do I know it's not going to be, you know, just a kind of a waste of money? And thankfully, Water Research Foundation has come up with this very uh, kind of complicated, like 13 tab long spreadsheet. A lot of data went into this um, and we were just the recipient of being able to use it. So if you're not familiar, you haven't used it, I would really recommend um, becoming a member of the Water Research Foundation and looking into this tool. It's uh, It's got so, I mean, days of information that you have to add into it. And it only is gonna give you as good of an output as you're putting in, of course. So uh, some of our staff went through that process and just put in local information on the cost of water, the cost of electricity, um, local construction cost, um, uh, what the population is, just a lot of information that is about Green Bay specifically. And the outcome, and this still has got you know, a little refining to do. So we have also uh, spent time with the city in saying here, when you update things, this is what you need to update in the spreadsheet. Um, gives us, you can see a, a present value benefit of like five times what our cost was into this whole thing. A lot of it is in the water quality department, which is where we wanted that to be. So, and in property value improvements, you can see recreation. Um, if there is a, a GSI that's a part of a park, a, a school, that kind of thing. Um, I, I think it's a really nice tool for the older people to be able to reflect back on. And then we gave the city staff the steps involved in how do you move from what we've given you to putting this project in action? And even beyond that, um, what about the next projects that you might run into? So beyond the CIP this year, when you have next year's CIP show up and the projects are different, what was the steps that our staff went through in coming up with this? And so we gave them a checklist that gave them a, a rating scheme. And so at the bottom, and I don't remember if it doesn't, at the bottom of this sheet, we have a little totaling. And we say, if, you're, if your score is between 80 and 90, you might need additional um, love coming from somebody in the community to help this happen. If you're between 90 and 95, it looks like a really good potential. If it's between 95 and 100, you have a winner for a project based upon, you know, maybe twice the size length of this sheet here that you're seeing. And then we gave uh, the city a tool on where you have a certain type of a land use, what would be the GSI that you might wanna consider. And this went for, for, for um, areas that are paved, areas that are green and areas that have roofs like buildings. So what kind of options do you have for um, a roof uh, for as far as doing a green roof or draining off to a rain garden or a bioswale? Uh, we also gave them more of like a step-by-step -step when you go through concept planning all the way through final design and maintenance. We held a lunch and learn kind of a training session for all of the city staff to get them, you know, thinking in this way and then seeing also that the mayor was um, in line with all of this. We used some of the previously prepared um, specs and uh, construction details. We honed them into exactly what the city of Green Bay wanted, made a lot of changes to standard specs that we had had, as well as to the construction specs. And then put this into two plans. One plan is a operations and maintenance plan. So again, this is a little bit um, similar to one that we did for Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewage District. Um, reef, furbished for Green Bay's purpose, and then wrote it up all into a plan. The plan itself is really not that deep because most of what it is are all the GIS maps, the 50 uh, locations for the actual GSI to be installed, and then you know the O&M plan, which is a separate document. So it won't be you know too big of a catalog to put, be put on the shelf. And that is really about it. It was approved unanimously by the Common Council in November of 2023. Two of the older people had said, first of all, that was the most concise presentation they had seen in a long time. The other said, we did not think that this would be as non-controversial. Someone from the community had come to the meeting, which I wish I could pay that woman because she was really a great spokesperson for us, and said how important to her this was that 
uh, you know, what she had done with her yard and adding native landscaping had added so many, uh, you know, had added habitat for bees and for other pollinators, as well as, you know, made her, her yard a lot more uh, sustainable. And she just was a good spokesperson. And so that was approved with no trouble. Then we held that training that I mentioned, and now the city is looking at, uh, you know, the projects for this year. And, and funding, which we're hoping that the plan will help them to find funding. With that, I will take a few minutes of questions if there's anything. Yeah, so uh, audience, please, uh, if, if you put your questions in the chat, I'll uh, pass them on to Carrie. I, I thought the, uh, the dashboard that you put together was really slick because, you know, if I was the person in charge of the um, actual maintenance of the BMPs, I'd think, boy, this is really easy to use and I can click this and click that and see exactly what needs to be done this week and prioritize things. Yeah, thanks, Like We felt the same way and that, you know, having dealt with so many communities that didn't do that, or even your stormwater management plans that have, you know, a pond that was built 20 years ago and, you know, the, the community, the property owner is supposed to be maintaining those and they're and there may be not, and not every city has, you know, a really good recertification program. So even for a private development type of stormwater facility, uh, it's very helpful. Hey, um, the uh, triple bottom line analysis I thought was also interesting because obviously convincing, um, you know, the powers that be to give you funding is um, always a challenge. And I think that the more you can quantify the or put a number on a dollar value on the, the the benefits of doing this, it helps with your sales job a lot. I would think. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, a couple of questions. Uh, maintenance budget was pretty big. Was that a big issue to the city? Uh, I think they probably preferred that it look bigger than smaller because you know, we. I think we usually try to. Um, oversell GSI that, oh, it's gonna take care of itself after a couple of years once the vegetation is installed and it's doing fine, you're not gonna have that much maintenance needed. They rather to hear that we really do have a need to consider what's gonna happen in the future. And that maintenance budget is across the board. So if you remember 30 of these devices are public and 15 to 20 of them are private property. So private property meaning when that prop property comes forward to develop, we were, you know, they're going to say, here's what's been sort of laid out for you. Please consider this. And then that maintenance is the private ent entity's responsibility. So that $300,000 wouldn't be the city's budget entirely. Another question, is this a project that you think could be replicated in other areas or communities of the state? Yeah, it certainly could be. It's uh, largely a um, commitment from the community and uh, GIS exercise, especially if you already have WinSlam data, um, the rest of it kind of falls into to place. Another comment seeing that the connection to between, I guess, the capital side of things and the O&M side is very important and great to see built in right from the start. Thank you. Uh, could you describe the interaction you and Melissa had with maintenance staff and any buy-in you received from them? I felt uh, maybe I was a little bit separated from the maintenance staff, and so she'd probably have better answers for that. But the people that showed up at our training uh, session also included like construction and maintenance um, people. We Actually, we did have a parks person and uh, forestry, and the forestry folks are usually really important in GSI because you're going to try to add trees into these, or they're maybe responsible for the bioswale surrounding trees. And they were they didn't seem to have any problem at all. Um, I'm not, I'm not really sure why, cause that would be unusual. I feel like that is something that we run into in every community. And in this case, maybe the mayor's in, and, uh, alderman's, uh, insistence that this is important just trickled down through the group. Great. Well, that was really excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leigh. Thanks everyone else. So next up, uh, we have Laura Herrick. Uh, in a role as the Chief Environmental Engineer for the Southeastern Wisconsin Regional Planning Commission, Laura manages a staff of seven with specialties in engineering, planning, and biology. She has 29 years of experience in the water resources field, 
specializing in hydrologic and hydraulic modeling, water resources engineering, water quality analyses, and floodplain and stormwater management. Prior to joining the commission in 2008, Laura worked as water resources project manager for the consulting firms HDR Engineering and CDM Inc. Uh, Laura received her bachelor's degree from Valparaiso and master's from the University of Minnesota. She's a registered PE in Wisconsin and a certified floodplain manager. Uh, Laura is going to be talking about the results of a chloride impact study that SewerPAC has been working on. Uh, so Laura, I'll disappear and show up when you got a couple minutes left. All right, I'm hoping I'm all live and good. Yep, we see you and hear you. <laughs> all right, very good. Thank you, Leigh, for that great introduction. So I'm here today. I'm the Chief Environmental Engineer at SewerPAC um, to give you an update. Sorry, we're not done on the chloride impact study. So I'm going to get going. Let's see. All right, um, here's my outline. I'm, I want to give you a little bit about SewerPAC just to set the stage, talk a little bit about our scope. Um, spend some time on our monitoring work because it was a significant, almost a four-year monitoring effort that, that we did for this project, um, and then spend most of the time on the analyses, which we're working on now, and then next steps. So just a little bit about SURPAC, where we are. We are in the southeastern corner of the state. Um, the counties shown here are our jurisdiction. Um, and we are, even though we're only 5% of the state, we are 35% of the state by employment, population, and wealth. So there's a lot going on in our corner of the state. And hence, we are a very large organization. We have over 70 staff. Um, how we were formed, we were formed in 1960 at the request of our counties. And shown here on the map on the right are all our communities in the region. Um, we are the area-wide planning agency, as well as the area-wide water quality management agency. And we do a variety, I like to think of it, we do a variety of projects that uh, transcend boundaries. They're with multiple communities or multiple counties. Um, that's where we get involved. And we do a variety of planning, not only uh, water resources related, but transportation, um, land use as a big thing for us, um, water supply, et cetera. <clears throat> So just a little bit about the project scope. This actually started way back in 2014. Uh, the project did at the request actually of a few of our commissioners. Um, and so out of that, we, with a technical advisory committee, we, we developed a prospectus because it was going to be a significant um, project cost. Um, and that actually was completed in 2016. I wanted to highlight the funding sources, big funding sources, the Federal Highway Administration, as well as ourselves. And then the Fund for Lake Michigan, MMSD, and DNR have also contributed. So our scope um, was to look at the whole region and impacts to all, all of our water resources, our streams, our rivers, our lakes, and our groundwater. Uh, what are the impacts of chloride in the region? What are we seeing for current levels and what can we do about it? Um, so a significant piece of that, as I said, was to gather conductance data for up to 40 stream locations and six lakes in the region. And we'll go into more detail on that, as well as compiling as much historical chloride data as we can find. Um, we're just finishing up developing relationships between conductance and chloride levels. Um, and I'll talk more about that. The goal is to look at, I'm showing here on the right, the watersheds in the region, um, the major watersheds, quite a few of them. And the dark line in the middle of the region is the subcontinental divide. So everything to the right goes to Lake Michigan, everything to the left goes to the Mississippi River. So we're in an interesting water resources area of the state as well. Um, you can see we're also gonna look at future conditions as best we can with land use and climate. Um, and we are also spending a significant effort gathering state of the art uh, for the management of chloride. So just a little bit, I, I'm not gonna go through all these. What is chloride? Why do we care? Well, I think the big one is it's soluble and highly mobile in water. Once we, it gets into the environment, it's very difficult to remove it. It's essentially going to end up either in our surface waters or in our deep groundwater sources once it's in there. And of course, it's problematic to organisms at high concentrations. We have taken a good look at all these sources of chloride. Some are rising to the surface as being more important than others. Um, probably the big ones are de-icing practices, both public and private. Um, water softeners um, being another big source, and then probably agricultural sources being the third big source from what we've uh, gathered so far. Um, but we're, we have taken a look at all these other potential sources of chloride to the environment. 
Just wanted to spend a little time on chloride criteria because it's going to show up in some future graphs we are going to use in our study. Um, and we have been using the Wisconsin criteria for both chronic and acute toxicity. Um, so these are the milligrams per liter of chloride um, in our natural waters. Um, so 395 milligrams per liter chronic and 757 milligrams per liter acute. And acute obviously is a very short dose and the organism is dead <laughs> or essentially dead. And chronic is those lower levels that will have um, long-term effects either on size of the organism or birth rates, et cetera. So chronic is also important. I also wanted to show here um, the secondary standard for drinking water is 250 milligrams per liter for where you start to get a salty stick taste. Um, that'll come into play in one of the lakes that we have um, sampled. So I'm talking a little bit about our monitoring work. So this is our study area. And as you can see, it actually extends north of our seven counties to encompass the rest of, of the Milwaukee River watershed shown there in green. Um, all of our sampling locations are the red stars um, shown throughout the region. So as you can see, uh, the colors are the various watersheds in the region. Um, we, we hope to hit all the watersheds, for example, and we wanted a good spread amongst our counties and communities. Um, we also wanted a good spread, spread amongst different land uses. We wanted some agricultural sites, some urban sites. Um, and I think we did a great job with that. And really kudos to the staff. It took a lot of effort to just get these established and figure out where we wanted to go. Um, so a little bit more, we did have those 41 stream sites. Um, they started officially in October of 2018, but we did spend um, in 2017, a, we did do a pilot study at one site to figure out what equipment we wanted to buy. Um, this was a significant amount of equipment to purchase, so we wanted to make sure um, we had um, stuff that would be robust. Um, and so we chose actually to not monitor chloride directly. Um, that equipment just, it was very expensive and it did not perform very well during our pilot testing. So we went with uh, sampling for specific conductance, which is very hardy. It actually worked out really well. Kudos to, to the team. Um, uh, this is one of the first studies we've seen that has um, had the sampling equipment through the winter. Um, and so we did have to spend a little more time figuring out locations that were deep enough to not be impacted by ice, safe to get to, and had some other criteria that we were looking for to be able to um, keep a system like this, 41 sites throughout the region, you know, three hours to drive to from the office from one end to the other. Um, so as you can see here on the left in the photo, we had everything was telemetried. Um, so the unit actually could be, we could see the unit back in the office, which was fantastic to try to keep this system up. Um, and then on the right, the picture is the cable ran down the side of the stream held down by some concrete blocks. So it really, we did not lose any equipment, which is amazing um, for the three year study. Some of it got moved and rolled, I'll admit that, but um, this design was very robust to survive the winter. And then the unit is actually in that PVC pipe you see zip tied to the concrete block on the right. Um, and so we did continuous monitoring uh, and data was gathered every five minutes to try to capture those peaks. And we did see some, some very um, steep peaks in our data. So because we were sampling for conductance, we also needed to do grab sampling for chloride to try to make that, to make that connection since we weren't sampling for chloride directly. So we did monthly grab samples of each site during the main two year monitoring period. And then we did event sampling. We actually added a winter um, to get um, some of those high conductance times. We called it event sampling and that continued into 2021. And you can see here the, the samples were sent to the state lab of hygiene um, and, and not only um, analyzed for chloride, but for the other major ions listed here. So I just wanna show you an example of some of the results. This is the grab sample data. Um, and so what we have is the, the period of record um, along the, uh, the timeline along the x-axis from October of 2018 to February of 2021, um, and then chloride uh, in, in milligrams per liter along the y-axis. And it pretty much pops at you pretty quick, the three winters um, with those very, very high chloride levels. Um, wanted to highlight the red dashed line on the graph is the acute toxicity level. Um, that we had discussed earlier. So we are seeing very high, very much above that, that um, acute toxicity level in our winters. Um, the two sites, so these um, sites are, are color-coded. So the green site is the Honey Creek in Wauwatosa, an almost completely urban um, watershed. Um, and then the uh, purple dot is Lincoln Creek 
in um, city of Milwaukee, also a very, very urban site. But again, we're seeing, we saw some very high urban um, chloride levels in the winter at our sites. And just to give you a feel, this is an example of one of the graphs I'll, I'll, that is in TR61, one of our reports showing the drainage area to the Lincoln Creek uh, monitoring site, which is the blue star shown on this graph. Um, so the top three land uses are shown here so that everything in color is the contributing drainage area to that stream monitoring site. So high density residential, it was by far as 34% of the watershed shown there in the bright orange. Uh, roads and parking lots, the black, and government institutional, uh, the blue. So a very, very urban site, and we are seeing some very high uh, winter chloride levels from that work. And we also did lake sampling at six lakes in the region, shown here. Um, they were sampled quarterly, and um, this came out of a question of chloride-laden water is heavier. Um, and so is it accumulating at the bottom of our lakes and causing the lakes not to be able to turn over? Um, we did not see that, um, but it was, that's hence we took um, profiles of our data. Um, so, and we sampled quarterly as I discussed. So Little Muskego levels, you'll see Little Muskego Lake is in Waukesha County in the uh, middle of the uh, map shown here. Their actually levels are approaching um, the um, taste threshold of 250 milligrams per liter. And I have a little more data to show you later on that lake. So that is it for the, um, I'm looking at my time, uh, for the uh, monitoring work that I wanted to talk about. I wanna spend most of the time talking about the technical reports um, we have in progress now or um, have completed. Um, we've decided to do the, the project in technical reports to start, and then we will finish up with a planning report, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. So I'm gonna go through each of these. I'm gonna talk about five of them we have in the works or completed. Um, in order. So first, the TR61 was the field monitoring summary. Um, this actually just, it is uh, online. It, you can find it on our webpage. I'll give you a link for that. And this just documented all of the field monitoring effort, um, how we came up with the sites, um, talk about the equipment um, and, and our data collection procedures and kind of was that background for, for all the data we collected. And one of the neat things, kudos to, to our staff, is they came up with the map on the right, which I really, really like. Um, what you're looking at here is the contributing drainage area to the Pewaukee River, I'm sorry, to the Fox River site at Waukesha. Um, and the site, you can see site one, it's the star in the southern middle of the watershed and everything in color. These are all the 2015 land uses. That's what we had available when we started the project. Um, are shown in the upper, but I love the lower. Staff spent a lot of time on this, showing those land uses by their percentages. Uh, same colors, so you can see lower density residential is the highest land use, but scattered, um, not, not so close to the river, but it gives you another view of that land use. And, and this, it took a lot of time to come up with these for 41 stream sites and six lake sites, um, but they really, it's a beautiful report and it, it's really gonna be used um, later on as we think about why are we seeing what we see as some of our sites, we can refer back to this report. Just to give you another example of something from the TR61 field monitoring summary is site selection considerations. This is me getting on my little soapbox of, these are the active USGS gauges in the region and we are really hurting in certain parts of the region, but this was very important um, this is going to really drive um, where we can do loading analyses, where we can take our conductance data and come up with actual pounds. Um, we need flows. And so we pretty much have a monitoring site at every single one of these sites. But I want to make the point we're pretty weak in the upper Milwaukee River. And, and you can see we're pretty weak in some other parts of the region. With We don't have any USGS stream gauges, so it's really we do not have accurate flows. I'm gonna move on. So TR62 is our impacts of chloride salts. It is being finalized now. It's, it's a, it was a huge literature review, I'll admit that. It's, it's a big document and there's a lot in it. We looked at impacts of chloride to, to physical and chemical um, parts of the environment, uh, biological impacts, infrastructure impacts, and then human impacts. So it's, it's huge. It's a really big report and, and uh, um, our staff, mostly Joe Boxhorn, did a great job pulling it together. Um, I just want to lay out some of the uh, main points is, um, is are going to be on two slides. I'm not giving it the credit it's due on only two slides. Um, so if you're interested, please go look at it. Draft is online right now. 
So chloride you know, salts, talk, he talks a lot about the, the chemical impacts, how it changes water, how it, um, you know, we talked about increases the density of water, um, how it releases heavy metals from rock, soil, sediment, and infrastructure, um, and it can really increase the release of lead from pipes, and how definitely we all know this, chloride salts hasten the degradation of metal and concrete infrastructure, and that's the two images on the right, the upper, a photo of an actual piece of concrete beam, and on the lower, just an explanation of why did that occur, how did that occur. Uh, continuing on, um, spends a lot of time, the biological section is huge um, and looks at a lot of um, chronic and acute toxicities from a lot of laboratory work. So um, please go dig into that, it would be fun. Um, but definitely, you know, major impacts to reduce growth, reproduction, longevity, uh, deformities, I'm a civil engineer and it gave, really gave me a new appreciation of the, where, where the critter is in its life cycle matters for its impacts from chloride salts. So hence, it's very tough to come up with a chronic standard that you're going, you know, what critter do you care about? Um, what part of its life cycle are you concerned about? It, it really, really matters. And then in, in the human health section, um, it's really about sodium. It's not so much about chloride. Um, so NaCl, chloride. Sodium chloride is, is what we eat and what is out in the environment has a lot of human impacts, but it's more on the sodium side than the chloride side. Again, that does not give TR62 the credit it is due. It is a huge report. Um, so please go look at that. Um, TR63 we are working on now. This is the chloride trends um, using both our data and looking back in time at our streams, our lakes and uh, groundwater. Um, but I just want to give you a feel for some of the data we have started to pull together. Um, this is actually the lake data. Um, looking back in time, so this is Geneva Lake down in a very big lake, our, probably one of our deepest and biggest lakes uh, in the region, um, showing you over time. So here we have going back to 1960 chloride levels, and the colors on the chart are uh, the different sources of the data. So um, early on, it was the DNR. In the middle, it was DNR sw in swims, in purple, and then we started to have USGS. And then our sewer pack data is shown in green in the 2018 to 2021 timeframe. Just for you, um, it probably doesn't matter a lot, but the open triangle are deeper than 20 feet samples, and the uh, filled triangle are shallower than 20 feet. Most of the data tended to be shallower, um, but uh, you can see this, it's, it's you know less than 10 milligrams per liter in 1960 was measured on Geneva Lake. And now we're up at 50 milligrams per liter and a pretty linear trend to that. It's pretty much a slow creep. Um, I did want to, cause I'm gonna compare this to Little Muskego Lake. The lake volume is just huge, 321,000 acre feet. And that has, in, in our opinion, starting to look at the data really buffered this lake from higher chloride concentrations as it is such a large lake. Looking at it a little differently, um, also wanted to look at how did the land use change. So the urban land use changes actually are very similar to Little Muskego Lake, which is interesting. Um, and they have similar contributing drainage areas as well. So in 1970, the urban land use to the contributing drainage area to Geneva Lake was about 33%. Um, in 1990, it was 39%. And then in 2015, about 44%. To contrast that, Little Muskego Lake. Um, so here we have the same exact looking graph going back to 1960 to, to today. Um, the colors mean the various sources of data. Here we have USGS data as well. Um, let's see, Little Muskego Lake started out a little under maybe about 20 milligrams per liter. So it started out at a much higher level than uh, Geneva Lake back in the 19, looks like 1963. Um, it's really risen very high, very quickly. Um, for comparison purposes, I have Geneva Lake sitting at about 50 milligrams per liter noted there. Um, the lake volume is a lot smaller. It's, you know, what was the previous? 320,000 acre feet to 7,000 acre feet. Um, that is probably the biggest driver or a shorter residence time if you wanna think about it that way. But these levels are starting to be of concern um, and you can see our, our data, both shallow and deep, it did have some higher levels at, at, for the deeper. You can see the open triangles on the green to the right um, are, are the higher levels. We did not see, it, the lake was able to turn over, so that was not the concern. But the scatter there is pretty interesting too, anywhere from 150 milligrams per liter to 275 milligrams per liter. 
Um, just to be complete, looking at urban land uses, it I was hoping for a real change at 1990 where it seemed like the trend kind of took a kink, um, did not see that in the data based on the urban land use, but, and it is a little bit more urban than Geneva Lake, but it's, it's probably the volume of the lake really driving it. So that is what we hope to do um, for also all of our stream data and it's significant. I think I was talking with one of our staff, we have about 200 stream reaches that we'll be looking at in a similar way. So it's been a huge effort just to actually compile the stream data for TR63, the chloride trends. Um, so we are in the process of working on that now. Uh, technical report 64 is being finalized now as well. This is our regression analysis from that specific conductance we measured in the field to chloride. So what I'm showing here is actually the final results. Um, so what this is, this is our grab sample data. So as you can see that third winter, we filled out the right side of this graph. Um, with more information to give us a better set of data points to work with. This is actually for 30 of our sites we were able to fit into this regression um, and it made good sense. Um, so it's in three pieces, um, but it's, uh, it's going to work out well. And this is what we're going to use on this regression to convert all our conductance data to chloride. Uh, so that was for 30 of our sites. We had 41 sites. So the other 10 of the other sites you can see are shown here. The piecewise regression model is the gray line along the top. And as you can see, these were all below that line and for very sm a small range of chloride and conductance. They just didn't fit. Um, so each of the colored lines, each of the colors are the different sites that we are including in this uh, evaluation. And um, it applies to 10 of our sites. So I just want to show you where those were to kind of, this is also in TR64. Th those, um, so we called it the linear, linear mixed effects regression model. And those sites are actually shown on the map on the right. So the site is in the um, red star and then their contributing drainage areas are highlighted out that slightly darker gray. It's pretty interesting. They are more rural sites and they just didn't have that large range of uh, conductance and chloride that, that they just didn't fit the piecewise regression. So that we are finalizing now, the drafts report is online as well. A final technical report I want to talk about is our legal and policy considerations for the management of chloride. This is also being finalized now. Um, actually, I'm sorry, it's, uh, it's online and it is final. So you can find it on our website that I'll share with you in a little bit. Um, this was led by the Marquette University Law School team. Uh, Dave Strifling led this effort. And we meant it not as, it's a menu of recommendations or a menu of choices you could do to, to manage chloride. Um, nothing in particular is said is better than the other, but these are the, uh, the seven different um, options you could do to manage chloride. And I'm gonna spend a little time on limiting liability, but you could think about chloride alternatives, water quality trading is discussed, um, direct regulatory strategies, um, et cetera. It's a really good um, compilation of options that we're gonna take forward in some, in some of our other reports. I wanna spend a little time on the limiting liability because that has actually been in our legislature, but they um, definitely, this is looking at it from a private contractor perspective. Um, why are some of our parking lots so oversalted? And we all have seen it in our lives. Um, it's that fear of slip and fall liability it really drives that over, over application. Um, and we looked, uh, or the team looked at um, a program in New Hampshire that is actually in place right now. It's called the Green Snow Pro, um, a good um, description of their plan and how it works. And it basically provides um, a snow and ice related liability waiver to certified parties after training. Um, they do have to do some reporting, et cetera, but it has um, held up to some uh, lawsuit challenges. Um, so that's, that's encouraging. Um, the challenges to the program that are uh, summarized in the report include funding. <laughs> it's hard to, um, in New Hampshire, they're having a hard time finding sufficient funding to run the program. It's, it's voluntary in nature, so not everyone's participating. And the reporting piece has been a bit of a challenge to get the contractors to report what they're doing and document what they're doing. Because if you do get sued, you better document that you did best management practices um, for the conditions um, at, for when that accident occurred. So just wanted to give you an update. There was actually a Senate Bill 52 uh, in our state legislature creating a DICER certification program. 
Um, it passed the legislature, but was vetoed by the governor uh, just recently on March 29th. Um, the governor's concerns with, with the program as it was brought to him included the limit on liability and the lack of funding for debt cap to administer. So I think there'll be more to come. I think Wisconsin and some of the other upper Midwest states are looking at ways to, um, to help the contractors uh, put less salt down. So I think I'm doing decent on time. I'll just go through some next steps. So we still have a few technical reports in progress. Um, we did talk a little bit about TR-63, uh, chloride conditions and trends. We are also working on that mass balance analysis right now, now that we are able to convert all our conductance data to chloride because we have the regression uh, equations in place. Um, that analysis can really take off. And the state of the art, we are in working hard. Uh, right now we're working hard on the um, water softening piece. Um, and uh, centralized softening, uh, doing some good research there. Um, and so the, all those technical reports are written to a much more technical audience. And then the planning report, the goal is to pull the best pieces out of those technical reports written to a less technical audience is my hope. Um, and then uh, look at a few new things related to alternate scenarios, future conditions, and then recommendations will be in the planning report. And here's the link to our study, um, sewerpack.org, just can put in chloride study and you can find all this information. I wanna give a quick shout out to staff contributors. It's been a huge effort for the commission um, and still ongoing, but I wanted to just acknowledge, you know, some of these staff have retired and moved on, but, um, and we're interns, but it's been a huge effort for us. So I think this is my last slide with my contact information and again, the web page for the study. So I am ready to take questions. I've uh, thought sometimes that I could go out in the parking lot and deliberately trip over one of the piles of salt and injure myself and then sue the county in as a way to try and get them to do less salting in our parking lots. Yeah. The, the only catch is the deliberately injure myself part. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Um, some questions here. Does sure. saltier water sink or float? It, it sinks to the bottom. So hence that worry about our lakes need to turn over in the spring and fall to reoxygenate the lower levels. So it's very much a concern if enough accumulates. I believe some more detention type ponds have shown that they don't no longer are able to turn over. They have too much salt in their lower level. I was, um, I think you're, didn't your, uh, were you surprised that you didn't find more salt in the bottoms of the lakes? A little bit. Uh, it was interesting. The concern came from the commissioner who lives on Geneva Lake, <laughs> probably the, the lake with the, the biggest volume. Um, but um, I, I, Little Muskego Lake will definitely be interesting. I think it's not getting into too much trouble because it turns over in less than a year. You know, so it's it's getting rid of the, the salt and laden water as well. So with all this monitoring equipment scattered around the countryside, did you have any problems with vandalism? And did you label the equipment, explain what it was for and who to contact if the people looking at it had any questions, et cetera? We did, we did not have a lot of vandalism issues at all, which was great. We did put sewer pack stickers on everything because we have an unit numbers, you know, et cetera. Um, we did find some high voltage type stickers to maybe discourage people from messing with it. <laughs> we did lose a few antennas. So there's like an antenna that screws on the telemetry unit that we think squirrels actually were, screw were messing around with it. And we lost a few antennas and we had a few pieces of equipment get like, uh, we had a unit on the Root River uh, below the Horlick Dam that we think some fishermen were waiting and just kind of tripped over it and moved it. And actually one of them units got pulled out of the water, but we didn't have a single unit stolen, which was amazing um, and wonderful. As, um, so you've done all this effort to quantify chloride in surface water. Has anybody tried to link the surface water chlorides with the application in the environment, either through water softeners, road salt, et cetera? To, to, to say, okay, if we put one pound of salt in the, you know, in either on a road or in a softener that translates into X amount in surface water. 
Um, we're hoping to do that on a on a not such a fine scale. Um, we're hoping to do that on monthly. Um, we've we've gathered all the road salting data, for example, all the MS4 reporting, um, and we're going to use that. Unfortunately, even on a monthly basis, it gets a little tricky because the salt on the road may not show up in the stream for till the next month, for example. Um, especially if it's later in the month that it when it was applied. Um, we have not seen it done to that fine of a scale. Um, we did see some study work up in Minnesota where they looked at the Twin Cities more from a, um, uh, a source side, like how much uh, road salting, they did it more from a source side. They didn't tie it to the levels in the rivers um, as strongly as we hope to. Um, so no, I have not seen that one, one pound of salt on the road equals X milligrams per liter in a stream or lake. You know, these reports, uh, the titles leave something to be desired, you know, TR-63. I was thinking if you could do what Dan Egan did with phosphorus and come up with a title like The Devil's Element. I was trying to think of something, though. The best I could come up with was The Insidious Ion. So you're welcome to use that if you like. Oh, all right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks very much. It's a subject we could spend days on, but... We have to move on. So, yep. So, Let's thank see. thank you. That was really interesting. All right. So, stop share. Hopefully, oh, we're good. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Laura. Um, well, next up, uh, we have um, <clears throat> Sarah Majerus and Eric Jost uh, talking about a stream bank stabilization project that they did on Mason Creek as part of the City of Oconomowoc's. Um, adaptive management plan. Uh, Sarah, I do not have a biography for, so you'll have to introduce yourself. Eric is the watershed program manager for the city of Oconomowoc's watershed protection program. He guides the city's adaptive management program to reach compliance with phosphorus water quality standards in the Oconomowoc River. The program started in 2015, focuses on watershed-wide phosphorus reduction strategies, including land management, lake improvements, and stream restorations. Uh, Eric also helps coordinate the Farmers for Lake Country producer-led group, which fosters peer-to-peer -peer learning about farming strategies that promote soil health and preserve water quality. Eric's work includes identifying areas of resource concerns helping farmers and other landowners implement conservation practices, coordinating watershed monitoring efforts, and estimating P load reductions through modeling. So I'll turn it over to the two of you. I'm going to disappear here. And when I pop back up, it'll mean getting close to the end. Well, thank you for the introduction. I am here with Sarah Mujeres, who is a senior scientist with Stantec. I'm here to talk to you about a recent project that our organizations completed in the fall of 2022. This was a stream re-meandering re project of a stream channel that was 1,600 feet long. Uh, it was a tributary to one of our water bodies near the very northern border of Waukesha County. So the largest part to this project that I can't stress enough was that partnerships make it happen. Uh, people coming together with the same end goal in mind, and everyone here in this picture came together at the opening day of the site area. Um, the, everyone in, in this picture had played a role in the project. Um, they were very crucial to everything coming together, and I'm going to show you how they all fit in. So first, uh, North Lake Management District had a concern about sediment being deposited into their lake. They were a major player in helping us acquire a trim grant. They helped facilitate the grant, as well as Tall Pines contributed to the grant application and um, purchasing of the land that the site had, the site construction had taken place on. Tall Pines is a organization that is all about land protection as well as restorations to natural environments. Um, Trout Unlimited played a big role in helping with uh, stream surveys and monitoring of the area. They have obviously an interest in trout habitat and production, and as well as fishing grounds. Um, the city of Oconomowoc came in very, very crucial at the last minute for helping out with uh, contributing materials for the construction site, specifically towwood. And then our construction partners at Wandra did a great job, as well as our design partners with Stantec. Uh, the city of Merton was very easy to work through with uh, permitting, and they were very supportive of the project overall. 
And obviously the Oconomowoc Watershed Protection Program, having an improvement in water quality, having a focus on improvement of water quality throughout the entire Oconomowoc River um, that was needed for this project to take place. So here is a aerial snapshot of where Mason Creek is specifically. Um, it is a part of the Oconomowoc River watershed. It is 49 miles long. That contains several impaired waterways. One of those impaired waterways is Mason Creek. It is in the central part of the watershed. It is a class one trout stream and it flows into North Lake. And the upper right hand picture, you can see a grass buffer on either side of the waterway. This picture was taken before the project was initiated. Um, ODPP had I facilitated this buffer to be planted. It was about 80 feet wide on each side. It did have improvements from that practice, but we, there was still more to be done for this project area since this, it was a straight line channel that was being undercut. And from that description of Mason Creek, you together why North Lakewood Trout Unlimited would have an interest in this waterway. And for this project to even get started, we needed those that needed the, needed the dedicated interest of those partners for uh, this project to be lifted off the ground. So here's some pictures of Mason Creek and the sediment that had been experienced uh, being flown out of that stream into North Lake. It has been a culprit of sediment deposition. And as we all know, as soil erodes, it carries phosphorus with it. Um, there has been so much sediment making its way into North Lake by the stream. And it was the facts that this stream had been straight lined many, many years ago. Um, this resulted, all this sediment resulted in the mobilization of the North Lake Management District to coordinate a significant dredging project to bring the backs, the north side of its lake back, back to its historical depth. Uh, it was an area that was once four to six feet deep had then became a foot or less deep with a severe weed problem and that promoted a lot of algae growth. So on the bottom, you can see the area of the lake that had been dredged. It was a significant project from a lot of sediment. I think they pulled out like 125,000 cubic yards out of the lake. Um, it was very impressive. So with that being said, it just proved a lot of reason why a project on Mason Creek would have a lot of support. So, but obviously, if you're not familiar with an adaptive management plan, why did the city of Oconomowoc get involved in a project that was several miles away from their jurisdiction? Uh, this project was able to come through to fruition through an adaptive management plan as a driving engine. Um, I'm sure if you are aware uh, that the Wisconsin DNR enforces discharge quality standards that wastewater treatment plants are required to meet. And in 2015, the option for wastewater treatment plans to enroll in adaptive management plan for their permit uh, became available. Oconomowoc was one of the first people that was interested in it and proceeded to get enrolled as soon as they could. So, um, adaptive management plans allow municipalities to invest resources beyond their traditional boundaries to improve water quality. Uh, this is achieved by reducing the ways phosphorus enters our lakes and rivers. And if we want to know more about DNR permitting, you can email me and we can discuss all of that. So the watershed, Oconomowoc Watershed Protection Program is the name for the city of Oconomowoc's adaptive management plans. We have our sites set on phosphorus reduction and phosphorus inputs, as we all know, have a direct association with water quality. We are a compliance by performance program. So that means that at our monitoring sites at the end of our watershed, we have to show a actual phosphorus improvement in the watershed. So our goal is to reduce non-point pollutant sources from urban construction and agricultural land practices. And we hope to improve soil health through the watershed, reduce algae brooms and en enhance local wildlife and ecology, as well as control excessive plant growth. Um, now I'm gonna turn the presentation over to Sarah, who is here to talk about a congruent watershed tool that was used to support this project. Thank you, Eric. I, uh, as Eric said, I'm a senior scientist with Stantec. We had the opportunity to work with OWPP, Telpines Conservancy, um, and the multitude of partners, you know, from the planning and design aspect of the, of the project through funding um, and construction. So it was a great group to be a part of opportunity. So um, in addition to being a focus of the City of Oconomowoc's Adaptive Management Program, 
And many of you may already know this, but Mason Creek was, was the focus for a watershed plan that was developed by Sewer Pack in 2018. Um, this plan addresses high nutrient loading and a degraded fishery in North Lake. Um, you can see here that, as Eric mentioned, this, the Mason Creek is a sub-watershed in the Oconomowoc River watershed. Uh, you can see that our project area is actually shown in the middle, um, kind of the north end of the pink sub-basin here. And you can see its relation to North Lake to the south. Um, many of you may, may be familiar with uh, the Mason Creek Watershed Protection Plan um, and Nike Element Plans. This plan is a nine key element plan, which is a framework for improving water quality in kind of a holistic manner. Um, uses this process, which we, we may be familiar with, of building partnerships, inventorying the watershed, setting goals, designing implementation, um, implementing the plan, measuring those, those uh, successes, and then reevaluating and improving the plan sort of in a cyclic manner. Um, so this, this process, really was helpful in providing technical recommendations to guide the goals for the project and also uh, provided eligibility under the federal 319 funding program. So it was, was critical for the funding plan for the project. Next slide, please. So the goals of this project, I'm, gonna, I'm now gonna dive into some of the project specific, you know, opportunities to work within with, in the watershed and with all the partners. So the goals were to strengthen, strengthen these partnerships, um, reduce nutrient loading, improve floodplain connectivity, enhance the fishery, and restore this degraded riparian habitat. Um, these The goals were identified in the nine, nine element plan and um, evaluated throughout the design process by different partners. I wanna mention Tall Pines Conservancy as the landowner, um, they were, instrumental in spearheading this project along with OWPP, whose focus was adaptive management and the North Lake Management District um, obviously had the downstream benefit and their dredging project actually occurred during the same timeline as this construction project. Next slide, please. So now I'll dive into the actual design process. Um, Pre-construction, the project area you can see on the left is a little more close-up view of the channel. It was a channelized ditch um, where we believe you know, high velocity flows are transporting phosphorus and sediment downstream. Um, we also know that there was likely legacy phosphorus trapped in the sediments um, that were resuspended and, and moved further downstream, impacting North Lake. Um, Pre-construction, the, the project area consisted of a, a pretty monotypic floodplain dominated by reed canary grass. Um, you can see in this image in the center of the screen here, the, the blue line is the DNR hydrology line. It doesn't quite align with the actual channel, but it's a straight line for, for demonstration purposes. The pink line was a 1941 um, derived alignment. Uh, based on aerial photographs. And then the teal line is the proposed alignment in this project. And, um, you know, you can see we we wavered between the 1941 alignment and, and the meandering profile. Um, and I'll describe that in a little more detail in the next slide. All right, so here you can see where that teal alignment um, kind of compares with the original channel, which is shown in the dark green on the bottom edge of the design. Our survey data revealed that the low point in the floodplain is actually further um, outside of the existing channel. And since we were worried about pulling some of that legacy phosphorus out of the, the sediments, um, we decided to re-meander the stream outside of the existing channel and create a new low gradient meandering channel to slow the velocity of the water pushing through the system and encourage lateral flow during storm events. So it actually allowed us to raise the profile of the stream up, up into the floodplain. Um, there's wetland scrapes highlighted in the design plan that allows additional settling for sediment capture. Um, and then our stream banks were stabilized with tow wood material. And actually um, in the previous slide, I forgot to mention, we, we identified some 
some sedge areas, which were actually pretty isolated at the beginning of this conversation of the project. And uh, we we did two years alongside Tall Pines, two years of, of reed canary grass treatment to try to bring up this historic sedge meadow habitat, which we believe was um, present within this floodplain. And then those sedge mats were used to stabilize the towwood on the outer meander bends of the project. Next slide, please. So uh, this is just an example of the typical cross sections. Um, you know, what was before a pretty incised channel and what we're proposing to do on the right-hand side. Um, this is a cross section of the riffle and the pool sequence. The riffles are shallower portions of the stream and the pools are the deeper portions of the stream. So the this sequence alternates throughout the meandering profile, oxygenating the water and providing fish habitat. Next slide, please. Here you can see a photograph of one of those riffles and then um, upstream and downstream of that is would, would be the pools, which are di more difficult to see. But this is actually, uh, this photo was taken before the stream was put online. Um, and in the background, you can see the wetland scrapes. Next slide, please. Um, so, you know, I, I just want to highlight the the importance of the, the partnerships throughout the project um, span from, you know, everywhere from design to permitting and into construction. Uh, it was critical to involve everyone, all the partners in all these conversations, because uh, as many of you know, it can be challenging to one plan a plan a stream restoration within a floodplain and wetlands, um, and then two, to construct anything with high water within an area with high water levels. Um, so we had stakeholders involved in permitting, construction planning, material sourcing, and construction, um, and then moving forward into monitoring the project. Um, our weekly construction meetings were open to everyone, agency members, OWPP, Stantec, WANDRA, um, were key elements of those meetings. And at times we had regulators um, join the meeting, which was great. OWPP was involved throughout the project, um, monitoring erosion and water quality downstream to help mitigate you know, conversations with neighbors downstream, including North Lake. Um, and everyone was involved in kind of adaptive management from an erosion control perspective. We had a lot of water to work with during the course of construction. Next slide, please. So this is just an example of, of some of the uh, kind of on the spot decision-making that the contractor and partners had to make. Uh, we, we constructed the entire stream offline to prevent any impacts to the fishery within the existing channel. At one point we encountered a, an artesian well and it was followed, I think, within a week of, by a five-inch rainstorm. So we were <laughs> we were dealing with a lot of water, and Wondra had their pumps going all the time. Um, and uh, we ended up building. You can see this bypass channel, the straight line on the south on the bottom end of the slide. Um, there's a lot of matting to prevent any erosion going into our construction site, and uh, and the steel plate there is what is kind of um, intercepting or, or blocking the project area from the stream. Next slide, please. Um, and here's an example of our adaptive approach to erosion control. Um, as we were visiting the site and doing our construction monitoring with OWPP, our original design did not have erosion mat in it. Um, we, we've seen a lot of damage and undercutting of this erosion mat in the past. And uh, in this case, it was decided that erosion mat should be placed. So it was a kind of a last minute decision and a good decision at that to keep all of the all of the sediment at bay. And it really helped with vegetation establishment moving forward. So um, a good solution. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so lessons learned on this project. Um, you know, it, it, as Eric mentioned, partnerships are key. So we we had planning documents to support the goals for the project, in addition to a lot of 
a lot of input from our technical advisors and the funding agencies were very supportive. So we identify the goals for all the partners, and then you try to balance all of that in the design and construction. Um, as I said, early engagement of these technical advisors and the, and the funding agencies. And also I would add that the uh, agency staff were critical to moving this forward. As you can imagine, the permitting was challenging um, and we were really grateful to everyone and their um, responsiveness in getting the permits through. Um, the weekly construction meetings, having all, all hands on deck there was important. And then water quality monitoring throughout the course of the project and beyond. Um, we also learned that it's important to have contingency plans for high water. So <laughs> next slide, please. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Eric, um, who is in cooperation with Top Pines Conservancy, working on the next steps and monitoring for outcomes. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. So as she said, uh, myself, along with Tall Pines, will continue to do monitoring by water samples. Um, and Tall Pines will, being the landowner, is going to take care of the land maintenance. Um, so what, I take samples on the northern end of the project area and the southern end of the project area, as well as about a mile downstream where it crosses underneath the road. Um, we're just looking for pre and post effects of the, pro the project site. Um, it's been showing pretty good results so far, and now that we just got this big rain, I think I have to head out there this afternoon and see how it's looking and pull a couple more. Um, we have noticed improved biotics. Uh, the Wisconsin DNR fisheries biologist, as well as guys from Trout Unlimited, have pulled a, uh, surveys out there for macroinvertebrates. Um, they've noticed good starting signs that uh, of invertebrates that they want to see. The indicator species are showing positive results, um, even being just so recent after the project was completed, they said they were very, very satisfied and surprised with the quality of biotics that were there. Um, we have noticed improved water quality through our water sampling, and especially we've noticed clarity improvements through just the fact that these pools are here and they're slow, the stream is functioning as it should, slowing down the stream's current. Um, there's been some sediment deposition in pools, which is good. This is what we want to see. Um, the reduced velocity is allowing some of the sediment to settle out and reduce phosphorus impacts downstream. As well, we have noticed improved habitat, um, improved trout habitat. Uh, we had aquatic vegetation already coming up. We weren't expecting that either. And it's providing good shade areas. And the upland native prairie and wetland restoration is, is like it grew up so fast and it's, it's looking great. It's green, it's lush, there's a lot of vegetation. There's a lot of observed flora and fauna. Um, we're pretty excited for this project area and all the community exposure it's going to get with the surrounding area. Um, we're hoping that the community takes an interest and appreciates what was done and uh, look forward to the future because I will be analyzing all the data and documenting it to share the success of the story. So with that, uh, we want to thank you for allowing Sarah and I to come and speak with everybody today. Um, it was a immense project that took a huge undertaking and we're hoping that projects like this will inspire more and more stream restorations will come. Yeah, thank you very much, Eric and Sarah. Um, got a couple questions here already from the audience. Can you describe how vegetation was managed and maintained during establishment and the vegetation maintenance plan moving forward? Establishment, I'll let Sarah take that, but moving forward was um, we have a contractor with a landscape professional that specializes in native restorations and native prairies. Um, a rigid, the first management was a mowing pretty much widespread. And then since the pro, since that mowing, it has gone to spot mowing of reed canary. Yeah. And leading up to the project, we, um, we started this conversation, I think two years before construction, and we knew that reed canary grass would be challenging for us and that we wanted to recover a sedge meadow. And, uh, so through that, we did end up doing some herbicide treatments to knock back the reed canary grass. Um, and it would, it was successful, um, just leading up to the project to try to reestablish some of the sedge meadow and, and then, you know, at least enough to use those 
sod mats on the outer meander vents. Um, yeah, and like Eric said, they'll be moving forward doing the spot mowing. Um, but I will mention that a native, all exposed soils were seeded with a native wet meadow mix. Um, and then some bare root shrubs were planted in isolated spots along the stream. Great. Um, other question. We're working on a similar project. Can you provide us with some of the lessons you learned from dealing with FEMA on this project? Good question. Uh, this this project was interesting because we did the, the modeling, floodplain modeling before um, before construction, before permitting. And it did, sh it showed that we didn't have a, this project did not result in a rise of the base flood elevation. Um, however, there was a small lateral change in the floodplain due to a former um, field road and culvert that were um, kind of bisected the, bisected the project area. And that, you know, we were in a rezone situation with the county and with the township um, so we presented the, the hydrology monitoring and the floodplain maps showing that there wouldn't be an impact downstream. Um, and this, grass. yep, the heck grass. And we, we worked with the, worked with the county and because the property is, uh, in a conservation easement will never be developed. Um, and the change was so minimal. We actually did not have any interaction with FEMA. Um, a LOMER was not required for the project. Great. Uh, will the new stream require maintenance such as dredging when the deeper pools fill with sediment to continue functioning the way it's intended to reduce phosphorus? There could be a potential of that, but at times of high flow, um, sediment has been moved slightly, but there is plans or at least we're waiting to see if further maintenance would need to be done. We are willing to obviously make that commitment. Yeah, and just to, to add to that, um, changes in the in land use upstream of the project will likely reduce the amount of sedimentation that's that we see on in within the property. So hopefully it's not too often that it would need to be dredged. Did the project put any focus on or implement specific BMPs to pre-treat ag lands runoff prior to reaching the stream? So like I was describing earlier with that buffer along the stream channel before the project was started, that was one of the long-term projects that has been done. And we have buffers along ag fields in the northern reaches above this project area as well. And we're currently working on getting a couple more. Uh, we have some land contracts for those as well as some of the ag land up there. We are cost sharing um, conservation, short-term practices like cover crops and no-till as well. But always a continued effort and we're doing as much as we can to get every, every bit of ag land above this stream project. Did the project have a competitive bid requirement for construction or were you able to work with the contractor from the beginning? They, we did have a, have a competitive bid requirement um, with our funding sources. So it did go out to bid. Uh, one, and one last question. Um, I believe your plan showed some tow wood, but in the photos that uh, the air photos and other ones, uh, I don't really see any jumping out at me. Was that actually implemented? And if so, how did that go? It was implemented and I apologize, we did not include a, a more detailed slide of that, but the, the tow wood is actually nestled into the outer meander bends approximately six feet. Um, I don't know that we have, and it is buried. So it's not, it's, it's not entirely obvious when you go and look at the stream. Oh, so like the photo you had a moment ago showing the matting in the aerial view, the, the tow wood is actually under the matting? The tow wood alternated with the matting. Um, in many cases, uh, we have a couple of aerial photographs that show an overview of the constructed stream alignment. And you can see that the, the erosion mat actually alternates with the erosion with the tow wood sections. So um, I think at the bottom, here we, well, you can't see it here either. We have some better pictures I can, I can share with the group. 
some point, but they are mostly buried. Oh, here, I guess we matted over some of the tow wood sections. Um, but it's meant to be, you know, buried in the bank and something that becomes, you know, breaks down over time and becomes a part of the, a part of the bank itself. So it's not very obvious when you see it, but um, during construction, you can see that the, the outer meander bends actually get pulled back six to 10 feet. And then we bury the woody debris, which is actually a combination of more coarse woody material and fines. And it's um, it's nestled in there pretty pretty well before the bank is stabilized with the with the sod mat over the top. Have there been any storm events since construction was completed that you would consider sort of a test? And if so, how did it hold up? There has been some significant storm events that have came through and there had been no negative visual effects that I could, I could tell that any detrimental damages had been done to it. Well, it was a neat project. I know I've been out there myself while it was still under construction. So I'll have to make a point to stop back and see what it looks like uh, this spring. So thank you very much for presenting on it. And I know we could talk about these all day, but uh, it's time for a break. So you're welcome to for... stop back and you'll be go a couple months after it's allowed to green up. It's quite incredible. Good. Well, thank you very much, uh, Eric and Sarah and much appreciate your taking the time. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, we have a break scheduled, uh, so we'll reconvene at 945. Uh, I think Kelly has some promotional stuff to put on the screen until then, so we'll see you in 13 minutes.
Well, I got 945 on my clock, so I think we could start back up again here. Our next presenter is Corey Horton, who is the municipal team leader and office manager for the Madison office of Rooker Demoki. With more than 25 years in the industry, Corey has extensive experience with stormwater and floodplain management, municipal engineering, parks, natural resources restoration, and development projects. His diverse background includes working as a consulting engineer, regulatory engineer, serving as a director of public works, and even holding an elected office. He received his master's degree from UW-Madison in civil and environmental engineering. And he's gonna talk about AI and stormwater. And I heard you talk about this a year ago, Corey, at the Fox Wolf conference. And there's been a lot of water under the bridge since then. Uh, John Stewart was ranting about AI and how it's gonna take our jobs a couple nights ago on a daily show. So I'm really interested to hear what you have to say. Thanks, Leif. Uh, as Leif said, I, I've been presenting on AI for quite some time. Um, I guess just to start off on this uh, cover slide, I have a, a an image generated by AI that I prompted to make me a picture for a magical robot that solves all of the world's stormwater problems. So that I guess is what uh, AI interprets as is uh, that description. And I guess most importantly, you'll probably see under my uh, uh, face there that I am not a robot. So I try to act more like a human and, and think about uh, what I'm doing with AI. So I, like I said, I, I started presenting on AI um, in 2021, 2022, and this slide actually was pulled from one of those presentations. Um, ChatGPT had kind of just hit the market. So, you know, although AI has been around since the late 90s, early 2000s, it really kind of hit the public domain, um, you know, 2021, 2022. Um, the big thing was when ChatGPT was released. And ChatGPT was a massive explosion in just the number of people using uh, AI on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, at that time, um, ChatGPT gained 100 million users in the period of five days, which was just kind of unprecedented in kind of explosion in, in any kind of new technology. Uh, in 2022, the global AI market was worth $136 billion, which seemed like an immense number. Um, it was predicted to, to, to grow significantly more. Um, and in 2023, we've seen that grow to 196 billion. And by 2030, it's projected to be $1.8 trillion uh, market. So AI is, is really kind of taking over. And um, you know, as much as there's pluses and minuses to it, it's going to be a part of all of our regular day-to-day -day lives. So I always like starting off my presentations on AI with, you know, what is artificial intelligence and what better way to get a definition is than just asking AI, tell me a fifth grade definition of what AI is. So I use Microsoft Copilot in this example and um, it responded back, AI can learn, AI can think, AI can see and hear and AI can help. It summarizes by saying AI is like having a clever digital buddy who's always ready to help, which all of this sounds great and just, um, you know, a fantastic tool, which I think AI is, but I don't know that it really gets down to the bottom of everything about AI. So I had prompted it uh, to give me a, a clever, uh, funny description of what AI is, and it came up with this a magical blend of algorithms, data, and caffeine that transforms silicon into a digital sorcerer. It can predict your next move, recommend cat videos, and occasionally confuse a toaster for a time machine. Um, and I think that last piece is, is really relevant. Um, you know, as much as it's, it's great to, you know, assist us and help us, it can make mistakes. And we definitely want to make sure when we're using it, we're not uh, coming up with a toaster instead of a time machine. 
So I know you're probably thinking, I'm watching a webinar on stormwater. Why in the heck are we talking about AI? So again, I don't know if you've played around with AI. I don't know your kind of level of experience, but um, it can really solve the world's greatest mysteries. In our industry, probably the biggest one is stormwater one word or two words. So I went to AI and I asked it, is stormwater one word or two, which is correct. And it told me both stormwater and stormwater, two words are used, but the more correct one seems to be stormwater is a single word. It goes on to say that the Federal Pollution Control Act uses both spellings. And it says, while both are technically correct, stormwater one word is more commonly used in recent terms. So I guess this will continue to be debated forever. But uh, the important thing to see here is it does give you an answer. It gives you some general context. As you see with this search, there's a, a bunch of ones and twos in here. Um, in AI, if I click on those, it will give me the sources of information that it's pulling that, that data from so I can kind of spot check it. Um, so that's an important piece um, with AI of just making sure that things are correct and checking uh, the sources that it's using. So more importantly today, I really want to get you thinking about how you can use AI as a tool to help you save time and to help solve your stormwater problems. So there's many different forms of AI. Today, I'm going to focus on using text-based generative AI in your job. There's also a lot of other AI tools that are integrated with um, Esri products, with Autodesk products for generative design. I'm not going to get into that today. Um, again, here's an image that I generated using Dolly, which is a, a, an AI image generator. And I will point out that it looks like stormwater is one word there. And I am officially in the stormwater is one word camp. So today I'm going to focus on two tools that are kind of um, easy for people to jump into. If you haven't used AI, uh, this is where I would recommend starting. So step one, um, I would either sign up for an account with ChatGPT. Um, you can get a paid subscription, which gives you a little bit better data, or you can just do a 3.5 version, which is an unpaid version. Um, or you can just simply use Microsoft Copilot, which is really getting integrated into a lot of different Microsoft products like Microsoft Edge. Um, I actually have it on my system tray at work. It automatically comes in with our Microsoft license. So Edge and um, you know, Copilot built into all of the Microsoft products is there and it's, it's free to use. So then step two is just jump in and play. Um, you know, I think many people get intimidated. I don't know AI, I don't know how to use it. Um, really, once you start playing around with it, you kind of get to learn the, the power that it has and the ways that it can help you. And you also learn some of the limitations and the things you need to be careful about. Um, so I'll give you some examples of how I use AI in my day-to-day -day job, uh, just to show you how AI can be helpful. One way that I find AI to be extremely helpful is for searching large documents for information. So in this search, what I did was AI allowed me to import a document. So this document that I imported was Waukesha County's stormwater ordinance. And I just ask it a question, what projects need a permit? It goes through, searches the 60 page document and in under 10 seconds gives me a summary. Here's what needs a stormwater management permit. Here's what needs an erosion control permit. I certainly could have looked through that document myself and probably found this, but it ultimately saves me time um, you know, in going through this. I guess one thing that I'd like to point out is AI can have hallucination, which is where it gives you answers that it thinks is right that are totally wrong. Um, when you import a document directly into an AI platform, you really get rid of a lot of the hallucination because the only reference document that it's basing its answer on are what you input into uh, the search. So again, this, you know, if I was doing a stormwater permit in Waukesha County and wanted to know, you know, what triggers a stormwater management permit, I can quickly find out 
Um, you know, if I have a subdivision plat or addition of a half acre of impervious, um, things like that, I can quickly get to that answer. Another way that I frequently use AI is in drafting documents. And the search that I did here continued on with the previous search that I did. So it had the reference of the Waukesha County uh, stormwater ordinance um, in generating this response. So I asked AI to write me a stormwater maintenance plan for a project that includes detention basins, rain gardens, and vegetative swales. And again, in a matter of 10 seconds, it spits out a whole lot of very valuable information for me. Um, as you can see here, it's gone through each of the things that I prompted it to uh, with detention basins, rain gardens, and vegetated swales on the next page. But it talks about maintenance tasks that I need to complete. It talks about reporting and documentation, uh, what to do after a major storm event. It even goes into what training and responsibilities uh, need to happen. So while this may not be a complete document, it takes a lot of the work and the heavy lift of, of getting started. And it gives me a, formwork, uh, a framework to start um, modifying and making it specific to my project. Again, this is, you know, can be a, a, a big time saver, um, but you, know, you can't just take what it says and, and use it directly. You, you always need to check and make sure that it's uh, giving you um, the accurate information that you're looking for. Another way that I use AI is for targeted web searches. Um, while you can go to Google or you know, do any conventional web search, AI kind of really empowers that web search to really enable you to make it specific to your circumstances. So in this example, I went to ChatGPT and I asked what grants are available for a stream bank stabilization project. And ChatGPT spit back at me, well, there's federal grants, there's state and local grants, there's nonprofit organizations. You can see that this is fairly general answers. Um, it gives me you know, some good targets of agencies that I could go look for grants, um, but it really didn't dig into the nitty gritty of what I was looking for. So continuing on uh, with my chat with the AI, I asked in Wisconsin. And then it changed it to, well, there's DNR, there's um, Wisconsin Coastal Management Program, there's Great Lakes Restor Restoration Initiative. So as you can see, it's kind of drilling down more into the specifics of what I'm looking for. And then if I wanna you know, change that search to be more specific to one of these findings, I can continue to refine my search and get the information that I need. So from here, let's say I wanted to um, learn more about Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, and I wanna know when the grant application deadline is. So I just type in the search and it continues on and it tells me that the deadline is uh, April 29th, 2024 at 5, a, 5 p.m. Eastern time. So you can see how quickly this really sifts through a lot of the internet information and really focuses it in on what you're looking uh, to answer and what you're looking to do. Another way that I use AI is to kind of automate tasks, especially things that are kind of repetitive, uh, that typically don't require a lot of thinking, but take a lot of time. Um, you know, in this example, um, you know, let's say I'm hiring somebody and I need to create a job description for an entry level stormwater engineer. Enter that into the prop. This is um, what it came back with. Um, it, it gave me basically a page job description, uh, which honestly is, is really pretty good. Uh, obviously, I would need to, you know, customize this, um, you know, for my specific needs. But there's a lot of information here that, you know, I can get in 10 seconds that probably would have taken me, you know, a half hour to kind of go through and organize and think about and, and put together. Um, so it's, you know, from that perspective, again, it can really um, help you to automate tasks that take a lot of time and make them a lot quicker. And many times I use AI kind of as a starting point to just kind of get the creative juices flowing for, you know, how to put something together. So in this example, um, I put 
um, write me a short outline to a watershed based plan. So let's say I was doing a, a watershed plan. This kind of, you know, outlines, you know, the various pieces that I should be looking at. And again, while it's not perfect, um, it's a very, very quick way to kind of get those creative thoughts going. And um, it also does a nice job of kind of organizing it um, into a, a logical um, path for me. So as Leif mentioned, um, you know, there's a lot out in the public domain of, of people just really, really afraid of kind of the, the downsides of AI. And there certainly are downsides of AI. Um, some of the the ones that that really, you know, I am always careful about, um, it's not always correct. Um, I was using AI um, to help me with some calculations and I was trying to convert gallons per minute to cubic feet per second and it gave me the completely incorrect answer. So I guess always keep in mind, you have to have a brain behind um, what you're producing with AI. Always think about, is this correct? Uh, check the sources, uh, make sure that uh, you're not just blindly using AI to you know, produce results. Another big thing is implicit bias that's just kind of built in. Obviously AI is pulling information from the public domain and you know, it has bias built into it. Um, when I, AI started, um, a lot of you know, searches, um, for example, if, if I used an image generation and asked, asked it to generate an image of an engineer, it would make a white male and that's what you're going to get. So there is an implicit bias that can be kind of baked into what AI produces. So keep that in mind that um, you're not perpetuating that bias in what you're creating. Another thing that concerns me is, is kind of the creative thought aspects. Um, while AI can be a tool to really streamline and speed up kind of those mundane tasks, um, I think we need to be really careful that we're not taking AI to kind of replace our own thought. Um, AI can't come up with creative, innovative, you know, new ideas. Um, you know, we can use it as a tool to help us get there, but it really doesn't uh, replace the human aspect and kind of that creative thought. Um, data privacy is another uh, huge area that, um, you know, with AI, we need to be concerned with. Um, you know, there are, um, a lot of policies being generated um, when you go into um, various AI platforms, they will talk about, you know, what is being used with your data and what isn't. Um, in general, if I don't want something to be seen publicly, I don't type it into AI. Um, there are platforms that you can get that are solely using your data that are protected, but really make sure that uh, your AI uh, data is protected before you enter any uh, private uh, information into an AI platform. Um, as I mentioned, I'm not gonna really talk a lot about generative design and things like that. Um, that's another area that I have a lot of concerns with. Um, I don't want people using AI to generate designs for things that they don't understand to know if it's right or wrong. Um, that's a big concern of mine that, you know, it will give you an answer. Um, it may not be the right answer and you need somebody to be able to cross check and make sure that that AI is, is, is doing um, accurate uh, calculations. So, uh, running a little bit early here, which is, is good because I want to have plenty of time for questions and we can even play around with some AI and I can show you uh, live um, how it works as well. But some takeaways that I would like to have uh, for you. If you haven't used AI, try it. Uh, think about things that, that you do on your day to day, um, especially think about things that you don't like doing and see if AI can help streamline that and make um, better use of your time. Um, as I mentioned before, don't use AI to do things that are beyond your knowledge. Um, that, to me, you get into some very, very uh, risky territory if, if you're using it to do things that, that you can't check. Um, going along with that, always double check. Make sure you check those sources. Make sure what it's telling you makes sense. Um, and finally, be creative. 
Um, you know, use AI as a tool to get your thought going. Don't use AI as a substitute to, to being creative. So that is the presentation and what I have. Um, this is an image also generated with AI. Um, as you can see, it, it can do some pretty cool stuff. Um, but you can also see, you know, even in images that get generated frequently, there will be errors of, you know, weird things, like especially if you have text in images, it will spell words wrong and things like that. So um, use AI as a tool. I really encourage you to play around and see how it can um, improve your efficiency, uh, but be careful at the same time. So with that, I guess I will open it up to questions. And then I guess once we're through some questions, if you want, I could um, kind of run through a little bit of um, just how AI looks live. And we could even run a few um, AI generated responses based on questions or feedback that we get. Sure. Um, you had a, a, a couple slides where you talked about that you asked it to summarize the, in our case, Waukesha County stormwater ordinance. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that it grabbed an older version of the ordinance and not the current one. And <laughs> it uh, it seemed to, it, it implied that, that we had separate erosion control and stormwater permits, whereas in fact, we lumped them together and um, they're all stormwater permits, but have different plans that go with them. So that there's some inaccuracies there. <laughs> <laughs> and that's exactly what I'm getting at with, with, you know, making sure that you're, you're double checking as well. Um, you know, it will tell you things and you do need to double check on them for sure. So here's a question from the chat. Have you tried using AI for quality control of plans, specs, reports, etc.? And if so, is there a best AI source that you've found? Yeah, uh, certainly, you know, another use of AI is kind of the proofreading and checking aspects of it. You know, many times I'll take um, either a Word or a PDF document and just, you know, put it into, you know, ChatGPT, um, you know, or another AI platform to just, um, you know, provide recommendations on, you know, improving the language of it. And um, again, you can kind of have it do a markup, see what it changes, and kind of decide whether you want to accept those changes or not. Um, so for specifications, things like that, um, you know, you certainly can can use that as a tool. Again, you know, be careful that that tool is not changing things in ways that that um, you know are producing results that you don't want it to. So usually, when I when I use it as an editing tool or to refine a document. Um, I have it do a markup version where it will tell me, you know, what it is recommending to change versus just automatically going in and making changes. There's another audience question. I know some industries are telling employees that they are not allowed to use AI, for instance, computer coders. How do you see this affecting our industry? Yeah, I, th I think, you know, many companies kind of, um, you know, need to come up with policies about, you know, how AI should be used and how it should not be used. Um, I think AI has come out so quickly and has become so universally used just by people, even in their non-professional careers, that it kind of creates issues that um, we don't have answers to yet. I talked about, you know, data privacy. If, if you start using AI um, on the job and you're, you know, putting sensitive data um, into AI, there's a risk to that. So um, I think, you know, companies need to start thinking about this, start thinking about um, ways that they want their employees to use AI and ways that they don't want their employees to use AI. Uh, here's another comment. Uh, they just had chat GPT calculate the thrust at a 90 degree elbow and found that the thrust calculation ignored the pressure component. <laughs> Yep. Uh, again, um, that's where if you don't understand what you're asking AI to do, don't use that as a tool for telling you, you know, an answer. Um, you know, if someone didn't have the knowledge to, to know that that was, was inaccurate, um, you know, some bad, bad decisions could be made off of that information. If you use AI to write a published report, do you reference the AI source used? 
Um, that's a good question. There's a whole, you know, ethical component to, you know, use of AI. Um, you know, many people kind of take the stance of, you know, AI is is using, you know, your prompts to, you know, generate content. So that content is is yours. Um, I, however, you know, again, for the most part with AI, with things that I generate and write, I'm using it kind of as a starting point and kind of taking over from there. Much like you would, you know, in the past use Google to, um, you know, come up with ideas for things and then kind of generate um, your own content. This is kind of just a little bit step further uh, from that. I typically, um, you know, most of what I produce, I'm I'm not heavily relying on AI, so I haven't referenced it. Um, but again, that's a whole ethical piece of um, uh, that is kind of being figured out right now. I know um, in the news, you've probably seen a lot of uh, music artists that are really trying to make sure that AI uh, isn't taking over the music industry and and using uh, content to create. Um, music from AI that is very similar to existing um, voices and artists and things like that. So I, th I think very similarly, you know, that could be said about, you know, writing or technical writing. Um, I think uh, that's a great question. And I think that question is, is slowly being answered over time. Uh, the problem is, is this tools out there and being used already. So I, I think um, those are the key issues and, and things that need to be discussed and figured out. Well, there was one more comment, and then we have a couple minutes left. You could do a quick uh, demo if you wanted to. Uh, the comment was, our company has actually partnered with an AI software that protects data so that sensitive data is protected. I also have a family member at a large sales company that uses AI to create invoices, which has drastically improved its efficiency. Lots of good, but you do need to watch what is being output. Great presentation. Yeah, thank you. I, I think all of those uses are, are fantastic. Um, you know, one, one big area that, that as a company we're using AI is we have a, a lot of data in our company and frequently the issue is finding and locating the piece of information in all of the data that you have. Um, so AI searches can really help you find uh, information quickly. Well, we have time for a quick demo if you care to do one. Sure, so I will drag over here. All right, can you see Microsoft Bing now? Yes. Okay, so um, probably the quickest and easiest way if you haven't used AI, you don't need to sign up for an account or anything, is just go to www.bing.com. You'll see this logo here, which is Microsoft's logo for Copilot. So if you click on that, it will take you to Copilot. Um, ultimately, there it'll bring you up to a, a prompt bar that you can either import um, like a PDF attachment if you want to evaluate that, or you can just type anything in here and it will use you know web-based information to um, you know get feedback um, based on what your prompt is. So Leif, I don't know if you can think of some AI question that you have or something, um, we can put that in here. Not to put you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> about uh, a question about um, most cost-effective BMPs for TMDL compliance. So you can see in here, it it is looking into kind of how you may analyze that, um, which really wasn't you know too focused on our questions. Um, so you know, as you can see, when you do a prompt, it will put other questions that kind of relate to that. So mm -hmm. I could I could do some common BMPs that may get more to the question that we put in here. And this is getting much more into probably what uh, Leif was was looking for and kind of the response that you would suggest. Yeah. So again, you know, 
it may not bring you anything earth shattering, but it might kind of jog your memory of, oh, I wasn't thinking about this. Um, you know, uh, it can be a very effective tool, you know, for that. That would have taken me the better part of an afternoon to spit out. <laughs> Yeah, you, you can see how, you know, you can come up with a lot of information quickly. And then, like, let's say, um, give me design guidance for green roofs. And you can see I spelled it wrong, but it will still figure it out. So don't worry too much about your prompts or making them too formal or even spelled correctly. It will still do it. So it gives you some of the considerations of, you know, drainage, uh, plant medium, you know, growing medium, plant selection, irrigation, structural support. So again, it, it really kind of, you know, helps. It gives you resources. So, um, you know, if I just click on this one here, it will take me directly to that resource. So again, it's kind of a supercharged web search to really kind of quickly get to, you know, information that's important to you. Yeah, I was thinking that in some ways it it seems a lot like, you know, the, the search tools that we've been using for years, Google, Bing, and so on, but with an added dimension of being able to synthesize things from the, the search results. Well, Corey, we're at a quarter after, so... Uh, I don't see any additional audience questions or comments, so I'd like to thank you for taking the time to reassemble this presentation after your uh, job transition. So <laughs> thank, uh, thank you very much for taking the time. That was really interesting. Thank you. Okay. Next on the docket, uh, we have Rick Eilertson, who's going to do a half hour presentation on professional ethics and stormwater management. Um, and this, I believe, should be applicable to the, the uh, professional requirement. Um, it's going to be half hour, and I believe it's, we're supposed to do two hours on a biannual basis, but at least it's uh, part, partly going to fulfill that. Rick earned his Bachelor of Science degree from UW-Madison in Civil and Environmental Engineering in 1993 and has worked in the municipal engineering field since 1990. Uh, Rick's early interest in community involvement in environmental issues began in 1972 when, as a child, he helped his parents create a recycling drop-off program through their church in the village of McWanago. Rick absorbed much of his interest in environmental conscience and responsibility through his parents, and grandparents as he grew up on a Sand County farm in Wisconsin, practicing firsthand all the Leopold's land ethic of striving to live on a piece of land without spoiling it. So Rick, I will turn it over to you. Great, and, thanks, uh, Lee. I'll, I'll pop back up when you're getting kind of to the end of uh, this stint. Awesome, and are you seeing my screen properly? Yes. Awesome. Um, so, well, obviously, we'll, we'll be talking about professional engineering ethics, um, and I've got a little bit of a stormwater management flavor to it. Um, some of the content um, that, that I've got incorporated is from American Public Works Association e-learning courses uh, that Nick Arena and uh, Suhan had put together. Um, these This was available last year when it, APWA just went through a website update. I think that they've got these back up and available now if you still need additional um, PE, uh, 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 PDHs. Um, um, but uh, I've got some other sources um, that are linked in the PDF that I, that I, that LAPE will be making available later too. Um, got uh, some code of conduct um, information from the company that I work at and some uh, stormwater plan examples here in Wisconsin, and then also some content on Wisconsin uh, Department of Safety and Professional Services, um, their website and some of the ins and outs of, of Wisconsin Administrative Code and how that relates to, to professional engineering. Uh, so definition we'll start with, um, this is actually uh, something that Nick had included in the Ethics for, for Public Works Supervisors. Um, so it's uh, uh, ethics or moral philosophy is a branch of philosophy involving systematizing, defending, and recommending concepts of right and wrong. 
um, defined or derived from the ancient Greek ethos, um, from athos meaning habit or custom. Uh, there's a couple other descriptions here. So rules of behavior about what is morally good and bad, um, a belief or standard that is in line with social standards. Uh, and then a set of standards used to determine right from wrong are a couple of the different uh, descriptions. So it's good to at least uh, get a sense of, of, of what that what ethics is um, so you can work work through some of the, the different issues associated with it. Um, one of the things that Nick had, had uh, um, recommended was working on developing ethical culture um, and uh, understanding the cultural norms and expectations of the organization that you're working with, um, whether it's your your workplace or or other organizations that you're involved with. Um, a lot of times they're not necessarily expressed in writing, but uh, inferred when you when you um, come across other you know either other documents um, associated with the, the organization uh, or just uh, um, discussions that you have with other other people in the or organization. So a couple of keys are working to develop together to develop norms, um, uh, committing to making a personal commitment um, towards an ethical culture, and then uh, having an opportunity to discuss um, norms and ethical issues on a regular basis. Um, a lot of companies uh, will have uh, annual um, an annual review of the ethical um, code of conduct um, or ethics policies that that the company has, and that's a good opportunity to to at least uh, revisit those and and refresh those uh, when when uh, when appropriate. So there's a couple of different ethical tests to, to look through. Number one, is it legal? Um, two, does it violate policy? Do you have, do you have, does your organization have policies? Um, three, um, does it violate professional standards? A lot of us are involved in, in uh, various professional organizations and most of those professional organizations have, have uh, either codes of conduct or, or, or code of ethics that, uh, um, that, that uh, all of the members should be following. And then um, fourth is personal standards. Does it violate your own personal standards related to to different things that uh, that 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 you're involved with? Um, so there's some rules. Obviously, doing the right thing um, might not be might not be easy, but it uh, um, will make you successful. There's the golden rule: um, doing unto others of you as you've had done unto you. Um, the smell test. Uh, um, step back and look at the decision the way others around you see it sleep test this is always a good one especially if you're if you're light on light on sleep um, um you know if, if you don't need to make a decision right away or, or react to it right away um that's always that's always been a good one for me is just uh sleep on it and and uh usually you'll, you're fresh the next morning or um even after a nap uh um, to, to make a, a more a, a, a more ethical decision. Friends and family, so ask friends and family for their opinion. Uh, front page headlines, so um, think about uh, how the, the how you'd feel if you saw your behavior um, shown up in the newspaper or on on the social media, um, basically any any uh, um, media that you that you. Uh, um, participate in. This one, uh, um, this number seven, for me, this is probably one of the, the best ones. Um, think about, you know, the most ethical person that you know, and, and uh, ask them, um, you know, what, what, what their opinion is, and, and how they would uh, um, handle, handle things. And then appearance, um, if you, you know, if you, if viewed from, from the outside, um, would uh, other people around me feel that that uh, that behavior is ethical? Perceptions, reality. Even if uh, you know, um, it's more about what. Uh, a lot of times, that's about what uh, people perceive that you've done as opposed to what you've actually done. There's a bunch of really good uh, ethical policies. Um, a lot of them, you know, overlap. There's quite a lot of overlap in all of them. Um, and uh, there's a handout that uh, Leif will be making available um, uh, that has has each of these different uh, um, codes. Um, first one is American Public Works Association. 
they call it standards of professional conduct. It's really, in my opinion, you know, just looking through these, they're all they're all very similar. But uh, um, there's some nuances that are that are good to be aware of, and a lot of a lot of the the people here in, on today's workshop call are are involved with uh, one or more of these different organizations. Um, ASCE obviously is the American Society of Civil Engineers. Um, this is the ICMA is the International. Uh, county and, and city and county uh, management association and then uh, we have the national society of professional engineers um, code of ethics for that for that uh, uh, organization as well here's uh um the basically the seven tenets of the apwa standards of professional conduct um, and i'm going to kind of jump through that uh, um, rather than um, go go get, get into details but it's it's in it's available in the in the slides um one of the things that uh, i'll talk about is the code of ethics at my workplace and i imagine that uh, many of you have have something similar um this is a virtual training but uh um, this is uh last year they actually changed it up a little bit this year um it, which is kind of nice you know again refreshing Re refreshing to see, you know, not, not see the same thing over and over again. But there's basically a pre-course assessment um, that you fill out beforehand um, and then go into um, a number of the different uh, um, uh, por portions of the of the training. Um, and then um, there's a there's a test that you take um, post uh, course. Um, so at least it, it gives you a, a good opportunity to to make sure that you understand what uh, what's important to the company that you're working for, um, and then also um, just understand the ins and outs of, of you know how 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 you how you really should be behaving, especially anytime that you're representing the company, but but uh, even when you're not. One of the things that I found interesting, obviously, ACOM is a worldwide company, and so there's different uh, um, codes of ethics in different portions of of the world, um, so there is some um, some uh, training on on some of the different nuances about uh, um, about uh, different items, you know, different items, you know, that that uh, um, are are kind of based on on country customs. Um, and one of the things that I th thought was pretty interesting, it's a little bit hard to read, but uh, um, dignity and respect. Um, there's actually um, much more. Um, from my from my perspective, much more um, uh, awareness um, put on put on or, or value put on on dignity and respect um, in the European area um, for our company anyway. So it's it just kind of interesting to see nuances of of uh, ins and outs of, of of that. Key take takeaways um, for um, ethical culture. At, uh, at at the workplace is um, making sure that that um, employees feel empowered and and that uh, um, they value that ethical culture um, to make good decisions and also ask questions or report concerns related to the code of conduct. Uh, making sure that you feel safe to speak up about without fear of retaliation. Uh, that's something that uh, I really feel. Um, I'm really happy about um, that. I that I see in in our organization. I think most of the companies that I that I've worked with um, also feel you know that, that's something that's important to them, um, which I'm I'm glad to see um, in our workplace. And then um, easy references to go back to that code of conduct, um, uh, making sure that you know where to be able to find that if you if you do have run into questions. There's also an ethical hotline that. Uh, that um, a lot of companies have um, that you can um, go to if, if you see something that uh, that doesn't smell right. Uh, one of the things that was kind of cool, uh, my my youngest son is just uh, started um, high school this this last year, and and uh, um, he had a uh, intro to engineering course, and and uh, he had actually seen that Acom's name um, under the the ethical. Um, world's most ethical companies um, at the sphere. So that, anyway, that was that was kind of interesting, you know, because I, you know, I, I obviously I'm pretty familiar with AECOM, but it was interesting to to see um, that uh, be be talked about uh, in a in a high school and and that my son remembered that as well. 
getting into uh, Wisconsin professional engineer um, ethics, um, we've got uh, Wisconsin Administrative Code AE 2.02 um, that uh, basically gives um, information on the professional engineer stamp requirements. Um, so a couple of things. Uh, one, there's actually a dimension that uh, that your professional engineer stamp is supposed to be within. It's basically one and five eighths inches to two inch diameter. Um, so it's now that more and more um, items are are electronic, it's probably important. It, well, it is important for us to make sure that if we are using electronic uh, um, stamp that uh, that we're getting it to that dimension. Um, there are um, approved designs for the stamps. This is one of the examples that's right in, actually in the code. Um, there's a few other examples too, but um, um, just know that there's specific uh, designs that you should be working to, to make sure that your stamp follows. Um, you can use a rubber stamp um, and uh, um, there are options for electronic stamps as well that I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, one of the keys that, that uh, I wasn't, I, I never was aware of, I guess, um, early on in my career is that uh, um, each stamp, each sheet needs to be stamped um, um, or uh, um, by the person that, uh, that um, directly um, controlled the preparation of it, um, except as, 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 in, as specified in this subsection five here. So if you have more than one, one sheet, if it's bound together, and the, the title or index sheet identifies, clearly identifies all of the other sheets, then you can just stamp and sign that, uh, that cover sheet or that title or index sheet um, uh, as long as that's the case. Otherwise, um, you really need to be um, stamping each different sheet. Um, so I've run into that quite a bit uh, for plan sets that I've been reviewing. Um, if they don't have the, that, that index sheet, that's one of the things that that uh, one of the first things that I asked that they that the designer um, coordinate. And of the next uh, items in in that admin code. Um, so if you're changing any sheet, um, and a good example is when you're creating an addendum, um, that addendum should also be signed, sealed, and dated um, by the by the registrant slash permit holder. Um, but really, any any change, and I suppose that really should be. You know, I, I guess I haven't always seen it on record drawings, but um, theoretically, it seems like that. You know, if, if there, there are record drawings that are that are getting created, it seems like that would be another good thing to to have stamped. Um, um, and then um, all all seals or seals or stamps shall be original. Um, so that's the crimp, the rubber stamp, or electronic meeting the requirements. There's a specific requirement of of Chapter One Thirty Seven. Um, that uh, and there are hi hyperlinks in each of these to to look through, and then plan specifications and calculations for building and structures not exempt under this um, statute um, by a non Wisconsin registrant shall have certificate dated, signed, and sealed by the Wisconsin registrant with the description and the statements. Um, so I haven't run into this yet, um, and if, if if people have, I'd be interested in in seeing um, any and then anything that you've got in the chat um, or in Q and A. But um, um, that was another another item. Again, these are all all eight items are in this uh, admin code uh, two point zero two. And it's, I, I, at least I felt it was good to to a good refresher to go through. Um, and then we're coming up on that PE renewal period. So um, what do we need to do? And, and uh, I just uh, pulled out a couple of the different uh, key items that are part of that. Um, because 2024 is an even number year, obviously, we have until July 31st to get all of our, our, our information in for this last biennium. Um, everything's based on a two-year biennium. Um, so the next uh, biennium will start August 1st, and we have... Um, July 31st to be able to 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 renew our that registration license. Um, there's a link right here. You likely will hopefully you'll be getting an email from DISPIS also. Um, but um, this is a good uh, um, quick link to to find that information out. So per the statutes, um, Wisconsin PEs need at least 30 PDHs, the professional development hours per biennium, um, and then at least two of those PDHs need to be in professional conduct and ethics. 
Um, so obviously this would, would qualify, if you're actively participating, this would qualify as, as a half um, PDH um, in that role. And then at least 13 of those 30 PDHs need to be real-time with active participation um, with the instructor. Um, and then um, one thing that if you do uh, um, instruct, um, you can get up double the PDHs for that. So that's another added bonus to, to actually um, help be a, a teacher. And, and this can, in my opinion, this, you know, if you're, if you're giving a, a lecture or a presentation on, on, on something um, clearly related to professional engineering, you know, that's, that's uh, something, in my opinion, that you could take credit for. But you do need you should have a certificate that gets generated as part of that so that you can um, have that in your records in case you do get audited. Uh, active participation in professional um, and technical societies um, can earn two PDHs per year. Um, so that's another added bonus for being involved with an organization like ASCE or or uh, WRWA or um, AWWA or or um, APWA, of course, so there's all kinds of different four-letter acronyms that uh, that uh, would qualify for that. Um, per, um, so the, let's see, uh, same, same items, but I guess one other thing that uh, added in here is that there are tracking sheets available. Um, um, so the, the second uh, page here has a link uh, to uh, um, the, the Biennium tracking sheets which is an Excel spreadsheet that uh, um, you can fill that in. You don't necessarily have to submit that, um, but uh, if you do get audited, um, that's something, that's the first thing that they'll ask for is a summary of, of that, that information. And, and if you've got that all in one spot, um, then it's much easier to, to, uh, to just forward on to, to DISPIS um, if, if you do get audited. Um, so here's the, the the members of the professional engineer section. So there's a whole bunch. There's like a 30 person uh, um, board all throughout uh, um, the architects through engineers, um, and then um, registered land surveyors or professional land surveyors are, are also part of of the overall group. But uh, there's currently four of uh, four members that are on the professional engineering section, um, and they it looks like they meet quarterly. Um, and they can, you know, they have the ability to to meet more regularly if, if needed. But um, um, they actually have their agendas that are, are posted online, um, and then uh, minutes are made available. They do have a vacant slot, so anybody that's interested in participating, um, I encourage you to to reach out to to Dispis and and uh, put your name in. Um, there's quite a lot of good information that's available in this. Uh, um in this link and i think uh i've got uh i guess i don't have a specific link um but uh, if you go there's some some direct links um elsewhere in in on the pre previous page so what does the the professional engineer section do obviously they they issue certificates to qualify at pe so this would be new professional engineers um they do have the ability to to revoke or suspend those certificates um um, if there's been uh, registered complaints um, or or um, items um, brought up, um, so they, they they'll investigate those 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 complaints. I guess that's down here, and then they'll schedule hearings with the the um, the person that uh, the complaint was brought to um, if those violations are noticed. Um, disciplinary that they disciplinary action that they get involved with is related to unethical conduct, incompetence, unlicensed practice. And this is probably the, the misrepresentation. These are, I guess, probably the, the main two that I've seen when I look through the, the um, database that, uh, that they have available on, on the, the DISPIS website. Um, and then there's, you know, there's some other practice allegations that could come in into play. Um, you know, if they're planning, basically, if they're, if they're stamping plans that they're not uh, a current uh, licensed uh, uh, professional engineer, obviously, that's an issue. Um, so there's a hyperlink here to the orders and disciplinary actions. Um, you do need to 
to um, agree to to uh, um, the description of the you know the requirements for viewing those uh, orders and disciplinary actions. There's a spreadsheet, and and uh, you can see you know what which what what uh, what's involved in each of those. Um, and then uh, um, we've got uh, um, so what stormwater documents need professional engineer stamps, um, and I and I'll. Um, Mention this is, I guess, my opinion. Um, so, stormwater management plan reports, in my opinion, um, would need those plan sets and sheets um, for stormwater systems and facilities. Would uh, in, definitely need those, um, and then project manuals, specifications um, need them as well as addenda. Um, feel free to jot, jot in the chat if there's any other um, stormwater management related documents that uh, that you feel um, would need need uh, um, stamps. Here's one, again, we do want to have um, active participation just to be able to, to give you uh, um, uh, credit for today's uh, PE, or the Professional Engineering Ethics uh, uh, PDHs. Um, so you can put in the chat uh, um, A, B, or C, or, or D, um, proper ways to sign, uh, seal, and date the, the stormwater management plans and plan sets. Um, and I'll give you a um, a quick uh, a, a quick uh, leader. I, I don't know if anybody's okay. So we've got B. Um, all okay. Um, it's a little bit. Uh, I'll just go through some of the different issues. Now, one of the things that uh, this is um, this is actually not the my this is my signature. Obviously, um, one of the things that's Kind of interesting is I, I'd heard I, I couldn't find it in the code, but um, I've heard discussions with uh, some of the different uh, um, staff at at Dispis that uh, they want to see the the signature actually overlapping with the PE stamp. Um, so this one doesn't over overlap with that. It, it's got doesn't have a sign date on it. Um, so as one that's one of the issues for A. Um, for B, one of the issues is that that uh, my signature is overlapping, but it's actually covering up covering up. Um, professional engineer, so you can't see professional engineer um, quite as you know, like you should be able to, because that's one of the issues with B. Um, C, I guess you know my 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 birth name is Eric. That's why my PE stamp has it. Um, my this electronic signature has has my my nickname Rick. Um, it's also not uh, um, intersecting or covering the PE stamp. So um, those are a couple of different things that uh, you want to be. So at least my 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 answer would be D. Um, like, and there's a couple that uh, had that response. Um, and Leif, we've got three minutes. I can I'll just do this pretty quickly. But um, um, here's an, just an example of uh, stormwater analysis issues. Um, if you're stamping a set of plans, you want to make sure that you're you're following. Um, normal guidance. So here's some guidance on, on, on some of the different things that I've found in, in reviewing um, stormwater management plans, making sure that, that you're, act, you're accurately depicting uh, run-on. That's probably the biggest issue that I've seen. Here's a site that I was asked to come in and help uh, review um, where the designer um, missed almost three acres of run-on onto the site, and that created Drainage problems on on uh, the resident right here, who had actually um, was a was a friend of mine and and asked me to to help uh, weigh in on 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 this. Um, the designer also missed uh, this portion of the site, um, identifying this as an analysis point. But um, the key here was that um, you know with missing this amount of run on, that really dramatically changed the the likelihood of of flooding on the on the neighbor's property. And included some structure flooding, um, so we were able to work with the designer and the property owner to actually um, make some changes to the site to address the, the flooding issues. But um, here's some notes that uh, just helped, uh, you know, provide some some context for different things that really should be thought about in designs. And then here's another one: um, the designer was kind of going going kind of off on a tangent. Um, um, for this particular site in Waukesha County, and and uh, um, when when after we had a chance to to um, talk about it, we you know basically had a meeting on site um, to um, really modify the, the their design pretty significantly and and actually work because um, the the design that they they had actually physically wouldn't work. Um, 
some giving some consideration to best practices that you use uh, to communicate during stormwater reviews. Um, this is what a practice that I used to use and, and it got really frustrating for me and a lot of other people um, uh, related to just putting letters together um, and uh, almost like letter wars um, back and forth on review um, email. One of the things you know that that uh, with uh, with the pandemic that it's brought us is a lot more people are able to create virtual meetings. So I found that those virtual meetings really can help to to work through a number of of issues. And then um, uh, PDF markup sessions. This particular one is Bluebeam, um, but I found that that's super that's been super helpful too to just you know better communicate um, with the designer. Uh, and the reviewer, um, what what each what each of you are thinking, and and uh, get further faster, and 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 you know basically um, get get to an a, a approvable product um, quicker and 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 with less uh, stress. Um, I do have a number of different questions in here, so um, I'm going to blitz through these. Well, I, anyway, I'll just I'll just these are in the in the slides and. Uh, um, I think uh, with that, we'll just uh, go to questions that people have. If we do, looks like we're right at right at time right now, Leif. Sure. Um, just a couple of brief questions. Let's see. In a stormwater management plan, should the table of contents be stamped? Yeah, it's a good question. So you know, based on the on the code, it looks to me like my interpretation of the code. It uh, it really should be. It looks like you know that they specifically the code it specifically identifies the index. So it seems like like that, like that would be typical. I typically see it just on the cover sheet. Um, so I don't, it's it's kind of a gray area, I guess. Um, it might be worthwhile. I am. I might actually make a note and and, and follow up with Dispis about that because I've only seen it on the cover sheet, like for like a pro project manual or specifications. Um, and usually the table of contents is the is the second sheet in. But um, if other people have feedback, that would be good to to hear. I know for our department, um, we look for a stamp on the cover sheet of the plan and the cover sheet of, say, the as-built survey. Right, right. Yeah, and I think the, the the cover sheet of the plan it needs to be clearly a cover sheet with the uh, other plan, you know, plan sheets identified on it. Um, it's because I've seen a couple of of different things that like that that has that that hasn't met. So, um, great. By the way, you were mentioning the renewal email that you get from uh, DSPS, and uh, two years ago, I was wondering why I hadn't received one. Found it in my junk email. Somehow, right. Yeah. Or uh, firewall didn't didn't like it. Not sure why. Um, when you're talking, one one thing that occurred to me is, you know, as a regulator, just how much of our system is an honor system, really. I mean, we. Right. You can only check so much stuff. And so you're saying, you know, we, we require you to submit this stuff and we require you to stamp it to show that you're making your best effort and it's a valid submittal. Right, right. So, well, I think we should move on to the next presentation, which is also you. So uh, don't go any place. Right. Um, next up, we have uh, Rick. Maria Hart and Ezra Meyer, all, all of whom are members of the WICCI Infrastructure Working Group, you're going to have to tell them what WICCI stands for, um, are going to talk about climate change adaptation and mitigation and civil engineering infrastructure. Um, let me quickly introduce uh, Ezra and Maria. Uh, Ezra is in the DNR. He joined the department in August of 23 as a climate resilience outreach specialist, a position focused on making the most of the substantial increased water infrastructure investments in the 2021 federal bipartisan infrastructure law. In this role, Ezra conducts outreach, assists tribal and local governments across the state, and coordinates with partners in how department funding programs, principally the Clean Water Fund and the Safe Drinking Water Loan Program, and other sources of funding can support projects that make wastewater, stormwater, and drinking water infrastructure, communities, and watershed ecosystems more resilient to present and future impacts of climate change. And then for um, Maria, 
Uh, Maria Viteri Hart is a transportation planning professional, owner of Nomad Planners LLC, and an emerita associate researcher from UW's College of Engineering. At UW Madison, she worked at the National Center for Freight Infrastructure and Research Education, managed the Midwest Transportation Workforce Center before pivoting to climate change adaptation. She's a co-founder of Wiki's Infrastructure Working Group and an active member of the American Society of Adaptation Professionals. Maria holds a Master of Urban Plan and Regional Planning from the University of New Orleans. Um, and I, Rick, I believe your, the format is each of you, I think, are going to do a short individual presentation and then follow that up with a sort of roundtable discussion. Uh, you're I think what I'd like to do um, is, uh, so Maria's going to start and then I'll I'll fill in the middle and then as we'll, we'll do a wrap up, um, but I, we, we'd really like to people for people to to answer any questions that they have either in the Q&A or the chat and then, uh, um, you know, hopefully we can try, try to make this kind of a, a group discussion throughout the whole presentation. Um, um, and then, you know, the two of us that aren't speaking at the time will uh, will will try to monitor the chat along with Leif. Sounds good. Go for it. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, all right. This is the last presentation, and uh, I'm so excited to hear, be here. And I want to invite you all to become to look into our um, this wiki uh, collaboration and join us. Um, and you're all invited. Okay. So I'm going to go over wiki's mission and impact. Uh, Rick is going to uh, touch upon the infrastructure working groups resources that we've produced. Um, and Ezra will talk about the DNR's climate activities, state resources, and some of the things that the state of Wisconsin has been doing um, on climate change. And of course, we want to hear your feedback on next steps for um, the infrastructure working group. Next. Okay, so what is Wiki? So Wiki is a statewide collaboration of scientists and stakeholders, and it was formed in 2007 as a partnership between UW-Madison's Nelson Institute and the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. But the way it started was that there were several legislators that came to the Nelson Institute and asked, what are the climate, what are these impacts from climate change that our constituents are gonna have? Can you help us figure this out? So at the same time, DNR was looking um, and figuring in trying to understand what did they need to change in order to adapt to climate change? Um, what kind of policies they needed to change? What kind of um, programs uh, needed to happen? So that, that synergy, um, about 40 scientists got together. Um, they got a grant from the Baldwin Foundation to sort of help them along. And so that's um, what, um, how it all started. So like I said, uh, you know, they, they were really focused on climate change adaptation. You know, that what are those things you have to do to change the way um, uh, in order to take into account, account uh, changes in the climate? This is very different from another uh, word that we use in climate change, which is mitigation. And mitigation is what um, needs to happen to draw down greenhouse gas emissions. So energy efficiency, EVs, carbon capture, that all falls under mitigation. Um, and uh, let's go on to the next slide. So one of the big things that happened with this, I'm gonna call it Wiki 1.0, um, was this assessment. Um, this was very much ahead of the times um, and it was, um, it, it was, uh, uh, it, so when, when we talk about assessment, we're talking about sort of a snapshot of what is happening at that time and place. And this word assessment is, um, it was very, you know, alien to me coming from the transportation sector. You know, we called every every adaptation uh, action mitigation. So, so I'm, I was just kind of learning this. So I wanna share this with you as well. So the, um, so there, there are assessment reports that are happening at the UN level for the whole world, as well as at the US level. So there's the sixth assessment, um, the, the UN and the and uh, and the the U um, and Wisconsin. I mean, <laughs> the USA uh, has uh, completed the fifth assessment. So these are scientists that come together. They volunteer their time 
to assess, to read all the literature that's been produced since the last assessment and, and, and you know, come with more information um, uh, of where we are, what we know, what is happening, what needs to happen, um, and, and so on. So, uh, so this idea of volunteers, so that is the same thing that's happening with Wiki. We are all volunteers. Um, some of us uh, uh, work on climate change as part of our jobs, but for many of us, especially in the infrastructure working group, we're consultants and um, so we volunteer our time. So in during the 2011 time, you know, there were all these working groups and you can see there was a Green Bay one, there was a Milwaukee one, there was a Central Sands hydrology. So people come together and work on things that are of interest to themselves. Um, and 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 uh, so th they all wrote position papers. Um, and as you can see, the Stormwater Working Group, which has Rick there, Rick's name there, um, uh, worked on uh, managing high flow and high water levels in Wisconsin. All right, um, next. So uh, during that, uh, so what happened, um, during 2011 and 2018, as we had the Scott Walker years where there wasn't much activity, uh, there was no activity at the state agency level, although communities still worked on climate change, but Wiki itself uh, had a very low profile. Some of the working groups continued, some of them uh, closed shop, uh, but there was one, um, the human health um, group, they got a grant from the CDC and they were able to put this toolkit together that was very uh, a, a, a big accomplishment um, for um, Wiki. In 2019, the National Adaptation Forum was held in Madison um, and many of the Wiki's um, leaders were asked to uh, speak at the conference. And so they had an idea, should we have a meeting there to sort of think about re-energizing Wiki. And so I attended that meeting. I had just left the university and I was looking at climate change as perhaps something that I could dedicate some time to, but I didn't know much. And um, so after that meeting, um, we talked about having a, um, a transportation working group. And so that was in the, in the talks there. Um, what also happened was that the uh, Governor Evers came out with this executive order on the task force on climate change and directed Wiki to, to provide the, the scientific data. So this update of all the scientific data kind of moved in into that second assessment that we had um, in um, uh, 2021. So getting back to what happened in 2019 is what, you know, we, um, we decided, uh, uh, Rob Montgomery was also um, in the initial stormwater group, um, also had some ideas of what to do in the second iteration of Wiki. And so he approached me about creating an infrastructure group. So um, that along with Dan Wright at uh, UW-Madison, which you'll see his picture in a bit, um, we started off that uh, and we needed the backing of the Department of Transportation. So we went, um, uh, the Department of Transportation accepted a meeting with us and they uh, were very excited to join us and dedicate staff to our, um, our working group. And so we had our inaugural meeting in January and, uh, and then a lot of the activity that we, um, uh, we well, uh, Rick is gonna go over some of the things that we did. And then we released a 2021 um, another assessment. This one more based on stories of, of, of what people were experiencing, but, um, and, and then of course these updated climate data that Ezra will talk about and that needed to be presented to the task force. So the mission for Wiki is really to generate and share this information. So we have the structure um, right now. It's, we still have a lot of working groups um, we I, we have leadership both from UW and from uh, DNR, and there's a actual a team that coordinates the communication between all these groups. We have a science advisory board that comes out and says, "Hey, maybe," um, and they're, again, they're broad uh, thinkers there, and so they're saying, "You know, maybe we should be looking at climate migration." So then an ad hoc group gets together and you know and and looks into that. 
Um, we have an outcome of the advisory board that is new, that is really sort of making sure that we're talking to each other, that we're coordinating, um, that the things that we're doing are really moving the needle. And, um, and so that's how we operate. Next slide. So the infrastructure working group, this is how we call ourselves. We're a group of infrastructure practitioners focused on updating civil engineering standards to adapt and mitigate climate change in Wisconsin. Wow, that is huge, right? Um, we understand how long it takes to, to change civil engineering standards. So um, while that's our vision, the conversations have been well worth it and very exciting to be part of this. Next slide. So this is the leadership group. Um, uh, currently, we are uh, ready to move on to uh, uh, to other things, and we're excited to uh, to recruit new people because Wiki, um, you know, if you have if you're involved in a community of practice, you come together and you solve a problem, and and then the group dissolves. But Wiki is sort of uh, expecting us to continue, so we're we're so we'll we're excited to see what the next generation of the infrastructure working group, um, what their ideas are and what they want to accomplish. But uh, I'll introduce you. Uh, Rob Montgomery is our chair. He was a consulting engineer. Um, he's now a professor in practice at UW um, Madison, and he um, spent the last year and a half. Um, uh, a little bit away from um, Wiki, but what he did is he developed a course in sustainability at UW Madison, taking a lot of the information we've learned from Wiki and incorporating to train that next generation of engineers. Dan Wright is, um, uh, uh, I think uh, Rick will talk to you more about him, but he's uh, uh, a NASA uh, former NASA scientist and uh, has uh, is in. He's uh, leading nationally in terms of how to um, measure precipitation. Um, uh, Bu Wang is also um, right there, up there with the next gen construction materials, looking at direct uh, carbon capture and um, and 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 types of um, embodied carbon emissions. Um, I am uh, I'm the person from the transportation sector and the planner among the engineers. So there's our Twitter handle. Uh, next slide. And if you'd like to um, talk to us, we're all very approachable. We love to talk. And um, we do have a mailing list. It's on our wiki page about us. And there's a link, but you can use our QR code. We are very excited um, uh, to have you join us. We have meetings from time to time. You'll just be notified of those. We have people from all over. We are open to anyone coming in and listening. Uh, we love it when people decide they have something they want to work on and, and create a subcommittee. Um, at our last meeting, Secretary Thompson was um, in the room with us, so that was, that was great. So I think we have one question here that we wanted to pose to people. Um, Rick, do you want to do that, or do you want me to move on with that? Go, go ahead. You can just ask people to put uh, a, a question yeah. or a response in the chat. Yeah. So if you were interested in, um, so just let us know if you're interested in joining the, um, if you would be interested in joining uh, the Wiki group. Oh, look, we have some great comments here. Okay. Um, yeah. oh, go ahead. I see Azra's put, put put in a whole bunch of really good links. Um, um, so there's a lot of great links and they're actually clickable, which is kind of nice. Um, All right. So do we have some responses of anybody who um, who is, would be interested in um, joining um, or signing up for our list? So yes. Um, All right. So I'm going to pass it on to Rick and uh, Thank you for uh, doing that. I hope you can uh, join us uh, at a meeting soon. Maria, can I just chime in real quick? There's, yeah. I can think of at least sort of three levels at which to plug in with the infrastructure working group. One is to sort of follow what we're doing and we're, let's say, um, revitalizing sort of our effort to regularly get information flows out through the email, email list. Um, after that brief hiatus, and Rob was gone and other things Maria mentioned. But so that's the, that's maybe the easiest, you know, lift is to just follow and, and get information somewhat, you know, regularly from us. The other is to join um, more regular meetings that we have. 
And uh, there's a group of about eight or 10 of us that meet somewhat regularly at the moment. And that's always open to more folks joining if they want. And then um, if you really want to roll up sleeves and plug in, we have a work plan for 2024 that we've just been finalizing. And there's ways you can jump right in on some of the work products that we're um, going to be doing on, you know, in, in, under that work plan. I think Rick's going to talk a little bit about those details. But uh, any level that works for you and your reality and in, in how busy you are in life and, and all that. But um, we'd love to have folks join. Yeah, and, and the work plans are are there to be uh, amended as well. So I'll just add that, Ezra. Okay, thank you very much. On to you, Rick. Great. Thanks, Maria. Yeah, so this is my first uh, foray into uh, uh, Canva. Um, so Maria um, sent me the link, and I was able to figure out uh, how to add, it, add a few more slides. Um, here's a couple examples of uh, the wiki. So again, Wis um, Wisconsin Initiative on Climate Change Impacts, um, and then IWG is the Infrastructure Working Group. Um, so products and initiatives. Um, uh, there's a couple articles. Uh, one that was um, appeared in the December 2022 Wisconsin Counties Association um, uh, update, um, and then uh, League of Wisconsin Municipalities in September of 2021 uh, had an article that Maria and Rob had had put together on uh, um, on infrastructure con con infrastructure considerations in a cha changing climate. Oops, that's not the one right here. Let's try this again. Hmm. Go back. Strange. I'm going to try to jump. Yeah, obviously, I'm, I'm clearly uh, still getting used to it, but um, I'll just stay in this mode um, right now. Um, so there's planning, adaptation, and mitigation that uh, Maria had talked about. Um, one of the items related to planning was the survey that Maria had put together. And uh, several of us had, had encouraged different organizations that were involved with to, uh, to fill out uh, uh, responses to that survey. So there's a re the report is, is available. There's a clickable link um, that's in the slides. Um, uh, Daniel Wright that uh, Maria had mentioned um, has put together this rainy day, the Wisconsin rainfall project. So that's got a um, up, uh, up to date uh, rainfall depth uh, um, uh, and duration information um, available throughout the state. Um, so you can go click on, on your county, your area um, and, uh, and get uh, um, uh, information that way and, and be able to plug that into any of the models that you're working with. Um, Boo Wang has put together uh, the summary report, along with several others, on embodied carbon emissions um, of construction materials that Maria had uh, mentioned. Let's see. Um, so this is kind of going into information on Maria's report um, and basically had the goals of uh, confirming the infrastructure working group's research priorities. Um, so we already knew about uh, rainfall data and design standards. We wanted to um, better understand the state of state of practice, um, be able to establish that baseline, understand concerns and barriers, and then provide documentation to support planning and, and future funding requests. Um, and then secondary goals were making sure that uh, um, we are, are, are providing those wiki products at, um, uh, Avail and making those available to um, both members of the infrastructure working group, but also um, the community um, practitioners at large throughout the state. And uh, basically engage the public infrastructure community. So factors, one of the questions was what factors allowed work on climate change to take off in your organization and or municipality? And here are some of the different responses. Um, so uh, um, looking at, at uh, um, incorporating uh, climate change actions, complementing other projects, um, reframing conversations in terms of energy and the environment, firsthand experience with emergencies and in impacts. And I've got, I'll talk a little bit about that 
uh, later on. That was one of the, the stories that I was able to contribute to. Um, uh, getting staff getting buy-in from council members. Um, and then um, we, you know, generally when you've got a better working relationship between staff and council, um, that, that uh, does a better job of getting stuff done. Um, dedicated, uh, um, when you're dedicating personnel to those issues, that obviously helps. Um, and then uh, um, for some of the consultants out there like me, if, if uh, clients are asking for that, then, then obviously that helps to, to, um, to become a focus for, for you. Um, lowering emissions and fuels, um, sense of urgency among elected officials. Um, and I think that's uh, something that I've, I've certainly seen and, and felt a number of, uh, 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 especially any time that we've got uh, some of these different big rainfall events that uh, have catastrophic failures associated with them, which we've been having a lot more of lately. Uh, and then um, incorporating climate change considerations into planning efforts, um, especially watershed and hazard mitigation planning. We've um, uh, seen a, a number of those talked about already um, in, in this workshop, and we've seen a number of other really good presentations on watershed planning um, that numerous communities around the state have been working on. Um, so this is some of the, this is what, a quote that it was in the Wisconsin, Washington Post um, back in 2021. Um, design standards uh, are based on precipitation estimates. Um, and in many states, those standards no longer accurately portray the risk to infrastructure intended to last decades. And that's one of the key um, items related to, um, oops, to, uh, let's see if I can go back to, Um, Rick, maybe if really, you hit present, it might go back to it. Back to that again. Yeah. Yeah, I'll just try it. Yeah, that seems to be working better. Um, yeah, so this is the data portal. So there's a hyperlink here that you can click on. Um, to get to the, the data and you can actually, it's an interactive uh, um, um, portal that you can uh, um, provide what you're interested in and, and be able to get that updated, uh, down, download that table. Um, several different uh, uh, links are available here at, uh, uh, you know, the various fact sheets um, and then that final project report that Daniel put together. Um, video and PowerPoint slides are available there. And again, if you do have questions, Daniel writes uh, um, very responsive and getting back to getting back to you. Um, some of the other things that Boo has been working on has been the um, carbon footprint of the infrastructure, especially with um, one of the big focus has been has been concrete and looking at uh, um, those the embodied emissions of 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 uh, the materials that we're using. Um, so there's some good good information in here about uh, um, new and innovative uh, things that are that are coming ahead in in especially in in uh, in concrete, um, but other products as well. And then Chris Chris Esther has been working pretty heavily on on uh, um, road stream crossing work group um, and providing that content available um, that's currently under review, and we uh, we hope to get that uh, um, posted. Uh, and made available to to uh, to practitioners um, shortly, um, but basically looking at uh, um, prioritizing crossing replacement projects and then um, providing that technical and financial assistance um, to upgrade those vulnerable road stream crossings with uh, right sized structures. One of the things that I thought was really cool, I, I was able to to be. We had a, a quite a few people were able to attend the February 2022 infrastructure working group meeting. Um, and I was talking with uh, Jake Brunaler from ADS afterwards. Both of us had to turn our cameras off because our jaws just dropped after we had um, heard about the, the work that uh, these two Girl Scout troops in the Madison area had been working on. So there's a, a clickable link uh, to a video that uh, they put together on, on, on you know, understanding um, the emissions associated with, with concrete and working to um, try to um, improve uh, 
some of the different uh, uh, materials um, that uh, to help reduce the, the carbon content uh, um, being utilized. Um, and they actually gave a presentation to um, City of Madison Common Council and, and uh, um, you know, that, that uh, encouraged the Common Council to incorporate a resolution to work on, on some pilot projects related to that. So, you know, that's, that was something I thought was really, was really neat to see um, community members actively engaging and, and coming up with solutions for some of the, the challenges we face. And then the last slide that I have is um, just the climate change stories that are all available. Again, these are clickable um, in the in the PDF that uh, you'll see. Um, we've got back-to-back -back flooding events that uh, um, the city of Brookfield to help provide some content for, um, there's a, a good uh, story about carbon content in the construction materials. Um, Ozaki County obviously is not too far, it was, is within the area. So um, the issues associated with bluff erosion um, this is uh, a block away from my ho home in Baraboo here, um, where there's a, there's all kinds of different super large trees that have been obviously around for, this one's probably only about 80 years old, but there were some um, big black walnuts um, that, uh, that that all toppled over in this downburst or uh, or microburst that's also called the been called the derecho. Um, it only affected like an eight block area, but just did some horrendous damage. Um, one of the the just a block away, um, there's a tree that knocked a, a hundred year old home right off of its foundation. Um, so they ended up having to get destroyed um, and uh, and and rebuilt. But a um, lot of lot of a lot of infrastructure challenges that we've been noticing, um, and then some stories related to that, as well as what uh, what 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 people are are engaged to start working on. So with that, I'll stop share so that Ezra can can uh, share, and I'll hand it off to Ezra. Thanks, Rick. Can you let me know if we're uh, seeing yep. my PowerPoint? It's probably not in slideshow mode yet. I'll do that now. Yeah. How's that? Perfect. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. We're really glad to be able to talk to this audience about all of these uh, things relating to Wiki's infrastructure working group. But also, I'm going to now kind of zoom out a little bit to things that are happening at the state, the agency I'm at. Um, obviously at the state, which is WDNR, and uh, even some background stuff on climate change and climate resilience and what we mean by by those things and what, what's uh, really going on. So um, jumping right into it, because we got lots we want to cover. Quick outline of what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to dive right in rather than dwell there, but why the focus on climate change? We always are torn about how much do people already know about this or how much should we remind ourselves why this is so important and what's going on globally and locally. We're going to go do a bit of a, at least hopefully quick um, refresher or a reminder of just what's going on and how serious it is. If I had to do it in one slide, I might do this one, which shows how this January and this entire last 12 months have been the hottest globally on record. Pretty sobering um, information there. But also I want to bring it back to Wisconsin. We, um, we, and we have this great resource in the Wiki assessment report, the second uh, second one from 2021. Um, and so um, with all that great work by many, many different members of Wiki and all the different working groups, and then um, our science advisory board doing the peer review to really make sure this is you know, terrific information for, for everybody's use here in Wisconsin. Climate change is here and now. We probably know this after the last couple of years and uh, how much this group uh, pays attention to these things anyway, working on stormwater, flooding, where's water going, um, all of these things. But bottom line, we're getting warmer in Wisconsin. We're getting wetter in Wisconsin. We're gonna keep doing those things most likely just to see a little bit of the data. Um, we've had the, the last two decades were the warmest on record in Wisconsin. This last decade was the wettest on record in Wisconsin just kind of, again, sobering uh, factoids that I, I love to be reminded of just because it gives me that little get up and go every morning to keep doing this work. Our temperatures statewide have warmed up by three whole degrees Fahrenheit since the middle of last century. Um, sorry, jumped, jumped ahead there. Our uh, 
precip is up 17% from 1955 inches annually. That's a huge, huge change. Obviously, we all work in that and see it and see it. But uh, again, sobering, sobering, sobering details. And we're seeing these events all over the state. There's almost no portion of Wisconsin that's been spared by extreme rainfall, by flooding, by roads, by other infrastructure, you know, blowing out. Um, obviously, it's just happening more and more recently. Impacts of those changes are here and now. And uh, again, we you know the storm events, the changing of the seasons, the winters are warmer. We certainly just saw that this last winter. And uh, habitats shifting, the growing season shifting for agriculture, water levels in the Great Lakes always go up and down and by pretty big pretty big swings we all you know seen that over decades but it's happening faster and um you know just in the past few years we went from a, a, you know, a near record low to a near record high in just a matter of a couple of years that the periodicity of that used to be a lot longer than it's uh starting to be now and uh flooding there's no part of sort of no sector no 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 segment of wisconsin that's not impacted by this public health impacted the economy agriculture natural resources, all feeling these impacts. And we know it's gonna continue. The projections, the future dimension of this is more movement down this path. Um, even in our best case scenarios of political systems, economic systems coming back around, getting on track and doing what we what we have to do, making this you know the priority it has to be on the mitigation side of things, um, there will be continued change that's pent up in the system and uh, you know that's likely to last as long as we're all working in you know, our careers in this in this area. Um, the, the projections in the in the latest report just back up what previous projections were showing, and warmer and wetter is where we're headed for Wisconsin. Just some real quick swings through data that you can look into much more in depth in the report and online. But temperature changes latter half of this of this century in Wisconsin: warmer, warmer, warmer. Precipitation changes, for the most part, definitely wetter. Summer is a little bit more of a mixed bag than other seasons, according to the, the projections in the latest report. But um, there's lots of interesting detail to dive into here and really get to the bottom of this. The next report, actually, we haven't mentioned, but the next assessment report's due out in 2026. And I think all the folks that will contribute to that are likely to you know, really try to keep refining what we know about or what we can predict about you know, the future. Um, regard, as regards precipitation, temperature, all, all these important factors. What's our future climate look like? Obviously, two-inch, 24-hour storms are something this group knows really, really well, and um, you know, much more often um, every year is a, is a likelihood in the future. So, something we've all got to got to factor into the work we do, obviously. The impacts are going to continue too. sort of obvious follows on all the things that I, I've been talking about. Um, you know, I, I always, this is the time when I come back to sound a hopeful note. It's too easy for all of the, all the, I've covered up until now to sort of lead you to doom and gloom thinking, but you know, the, the progress we've been making in recent years and turning the tides um, on carbon emissions on, on atmospheric concentrations are really hopeful, I think. And, uh, you know the the bottom line message for all of us in the in the areas we work is we need to be taking action on mitigation and adaptation of resilience all at the, at the same time and in a hurry um we can't 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 go slow on this we got to keep keep moving every every minute we move faster you know offsets future impacts it could be could be pretty bad if we if we were to go slower so um wiki talks about you know now i think uh, maria noted you know the initial formation of wiki was very adaptation focused but certainly the latest report and the work of all the working groups more recently mitigation fits into that picture too so we need large and we need fast reductions in carbon and other greenhouse gas emissions and we need to do this in a sustainable or in a sustainable way but maybe more importantly even in an equitable way everyone needs to be a part of just, you know shaping these solutions and uh you know all those perspectives we can bring to this are likely to just give us more innovation you know, better, again, more sustainable, more equitable outcomes for everybody who is impacted, especially those that were historically impacted in disproportionate ways, you know, communities, geographies, um, et cetera. So really an important dimension to this is sort of equity and environmental justice. Some of the just quick highlights of what the, um, what the reports talk about in terms of 
how to combat climate change and and you know move in the in the, in a better direction um we've got to think about protecting folks from these extreme events obviously it's something we all do in flood flood work mitigation uh, hazard mitigation um the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions is a key mitigation piece obviously um forest cover and urban tree canopy are are a key part of the solution and then i'll talk more about this later but they're both those practices are both mitigation and really resilience so um interesting to think about the blurring of that line i'll talk a little bit more in a minute converting natural vegetation whether it's a development whether it's agriculture these are case steps for for the midwest for wisconsin habitat management because things are going to change where habitats are suitable are going to move and so the whole piece uh, around habitat for for critters for plants all of our landscapes And then there's the planning work that really, I think, you know, here ties right into the kind of re resilience or adaptation side of things and what many of us, you know, here on today's workshop are focused on, but flood risk reduction, pre-disaster mitigation, you know, I've, I've been coming up to speed over this last year on this work and seeing that FEMA has po put a huge emphasis on planning for and preparing for and being resilient to disaster in addition to the great work they've always done on after the fact what do we do? Disaster has happened, you know, but I think that's an that's a mode switch we all have to make uh, now. Infrastructure is key in all of this. Obviously, that's what brings us to you today and, and it's what you all work on. And so just underlining that point. So quick uh, with that fast, sobering, um, also hopefully hopeful <laughs> overview quick through all of that. I just wanted to shift to talking about climate resilience, a piece that I uh, focus most of my work on in my position. Um, and uh, just always good, a term like climate resilience just floats around a, a heck of a lot, but maybe we don't always know exactly what people mean when they say it. So there's a couple of um, different perspectives on it to think about. ASC, which Rick noted, um, says ability to plan, prepare for, mitigate, and adapt to changing conditions from hazards enable rapid recovery of all of our important societal systems. Union, Union of Concerned Scientists is successfully coping with and managing the impacts of climate change while preventing those impacts from growing worse. I'll jump to one other, but then note, nice blurring of the line there between mitigation and adaptation or resilience. In my mind, resilience really, really does sort of blend those two together and, and uh, put it all under one umbrella, if you will. One way we defined it in an internal document at DNR is the ability of all of the component parts of the state here to respond effectively to climate disasters, anticipate those impacts, adjust their infrastructure investments and management approaches for the future. Including again, that an, that last line sort of is a, is a nod to not just adaptation, but also mitigation. So the continuum, I think that bright line sort of split of uh, mitigation and adaptation maybe doesn't work anymore. It's really this continuum and this this uh, fuzzing of that line. Just some, some of the many ways that, as I do my technical assistance and outreach work to local governments on this, especially water utilities, there are all these different ongoing, you know, so, sort of routine activities, I think, um, are great places for climate resilience thinking to fit in for local governments. So infrastructure planning, course capital improvement plans, detailed project level facility plans and plans and specs. Don't forget operations plans too, that you know, the, there are elements of climate and resilience that I think can fit into operations and uh, O&M as well as, uh, as well as the capital side. All the land use and comprehensive planning that happens at local levels and regional levels obviously fits in here, hazard mitigation plans. Many locals are doing climate action plans. Transportation fits in. Maria knows that all well. And uh, I know there's county folks on the on the um, call today too. So county land water plans. We're doing some direct work with counties on how climate resilience fits into those plans. So pivoting again from that um, sort of reminder of what we mean when we talk climate resilience, but to Give you a bit of a flavor for what we're doing at the at the DNR level, and of course, you know the, um, the sort of whole of government um, under the Evers administration, particularly in, in recent years. 
and here I'm talking both, you know, about mitigation level and 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 uh, resilience efforts. The department hired a, a climate resilience policy advisor named Sean Kennedy. I won't do all, too, too much detail on this, but Sean's a great sort of a air traffic controller for all things on these fronts for all the different parts of the department. So I work really closely with Sean. Um, connects with other agencies, connects the part, you know, the moving parts within the department and that sort of thing. But um, Sean was hired just a few years or a couple of years ago, and uh, great to have him on board. He uh, facilitates a DNR uh, climate action team, so pulling together folks from all across the department to work on this. We have a internal blueprint on climate action that resulted from Sean's work and the climate action team's work, and we also. Um, which, which kind of guides what all of us do, you know, how, how we move forward and what our priorities are. And then we also put out publicly a, a, a climate accomplishments report for the department every year. Engage lots and lots of partners, private sector, nonprofit, other government um, inside Wisconsin mostly, but also there's cross you know, boundary collaborations with other states as well. Some of the priorities just internally at the department for 2024, we're focusing on what we can, you know, directly control and have and you know have uh, jurisdiction over the facilities that we own the fleet that we operate um our you know many different kinds of working lands forest lands egg lands and the natural you know um parks forest natural areas etc some of the key pieces of um of action by by governor evers in the last few years maria hinted at some of these but um in 2019 we joined the u.s climate alliance along with other states bipartisan group of states from across the country that represent a significant portion of the population, but um, all committing to the, the sort of international um, targets and goals on reversing climate change. Lots of different work groups and ways we plug in there. In 2019, Executive Order 38 created the Office of Sustainability and Clean Energy, which is housed in the Department of Administration. Initially, they were directed to and, and completed a clean energy plan for the state. That sort of again sets our state level goals on how we want to um, decarbonize. There's an emphasis there on workforce training, which is great. More on what OSCE has been up to since in a second. So they um, did that 20, 2022 clean energy plan pretty quickly, pivoted into the work EPA is, is sort of uh, directing through this climate pollution reduction grant um, opportunity. So significant funding through the uh, it, Inflation Reduction Act um, from 2021, 2022, um, we had to submit a climate, a priority climate action plan earlier this year. There are applications due any day now for implementation funds to, to follow through and implement some of the things in our priority plan. And meanwhile, we also have a short, pretty short deadline next, I think it's next March or April for a comprehensive climate action plan for the state. So the Office of Sustainability and Clean Energy is extremely busy working on all these pieces for the whole of state government. Obviously the DNR is part of that, but that's a DOA and, and a whole government approach there. Another executive order in 2019 directed, uh, something Maria mentioned, the, the climate change to, uh, task force on climate change report came out in 2020. Lots of details on solutions, again, at the state level, mitigation uh, mostly and some resilience in, in that uh, document, which I linked to earlier. An executive order in 2021 focused really on forests. And since then, we've actually, we had a 75 million tree pledge by 20, 2030. We've signed on to a national, I think national, if it's not even international pledge called the Trillion Tree Pledge. So there's a sub, even substantially larger goal that the state now has around tree planting across the state. In 2023, another executive order established this commission, the Green Ribbon Commission on Clean Energy and Environmental Innovation. This work is ongoing as we speak. And uh, I don't know lots of details about this, but I'm pretty intrigued to know more about what is, um, what's coming in um, something that they're working on, which is to create a green bank. So some um, kind of you know, fund to uh, advance innovating, you know, innovative work around um, clean energy and the other kinds of innovations we need to solve climate change. So stay tuned for more on that. I'm in the same boat as you, interest, interested to learn more. So again, the sort of state level, all of state level for, uh, priorities for 2024 really tie to this federal climate funding that's coming out. So the climate pol pol pollution reduction grants and the different plans we have to submit and then the implementation grants. I know in the Southeast region where most folks today are from, um, there's a whole, um, collaboration of folks, including Sewer PAC, I know from Southeast, that are working on one of these 
competitive grant applications to submit real, real soon. There are other funding opportunities. NOAA's Climate Resilience Regional Challenge is another one. Another regional planning commission and local partners up in the northwestern part of the state, I know, are applying for, for some of those federal funds. So all of that, you know, ties into Wiki's uh, great work, you know, bringing in the DNR, but others, other state agencies, UW, all the folks that Maria talked about. I won't cover all this because Maria covered the, the background and the formation of, of Wiki. I will mention just real quick in terms of DNR involvement, you know, we've got these 14 different working groups. You won't be surprised that a significant number of them include folks from DNR, either as chair, chairs or co-chairs, or members, fisheries, forestry, water resources, plants and natural communities are all ones that DNR folks chair. And then there's um, DNR staff involved in another six or so of them. So 10 of the, 10 of the 14 by my count have, uh, have DNR folks heavily involved in helping advance what the, each area is working on. I wanted to just quick cover, and I bet all of you know as much about this or more than I do because you work at the local level, but they're you know, thinking statewide. There's a whole bunch of terrific um, local, local actions happening. Um, there are commitments to those international targets and goals. Hazard mitigation planning has been going, ongoing for a number of years, I know. Regional planning commissions are, are uh, rolling out climate resilience efforts, and uh, of course, often in, in close collaboration with local communities. There's the Green Tier Legacy Communities effort uh, that DNR facilitates, but a huge number of uh, local governments from around the state are part of that. Sustainability commissions have been forming in many, many uh, local jurisdictions. Lots of folks are doing climate action planning at the local level. Um, there's a, I'll talk about this group more in a minute called Local Government Climate Coalition. And then, like I said, people are applying for this various uh, kinds of federal funding that are that are coming out. Just some quick snapshots of what's happening. We've got 20, 25 uh, sustainability commissions around the state. Green Tier Legacy Communities has about 35 local governments uh, and, and some counties that are members there working on this for you know, 10, 10, 15 years now, meeting quarterly, sharing on what's working and what's not working, and then obviously connecting with us at the DNR, all that good work. Wisconsin Local Government Climate Coalition st stood up in the last couple of years and uh, has got at least 20 members now that are coming together. They've got a little more of an advocacy bent. So, uh, you know, letting the state government and legislature know what is it that they're, they're running into by way of barriers that are keeping them from being able to advance the local solutions that they want to work on on all of these fronts. So a lot going on. I'm sure that I miss lots of things, again, that you all know better than I do are, that are happening at the local level. Hopefully that gives you a nice snapshot, though, of kind of what's happening at the state level, both at DNR, where I work, and then kind of the whole of whole of state government, executive and, uh, and legislative branches, if you will. Um, so another pivot here, one of the thing, key things I work on in my work is plugging climate resilience in on all of the water infrastructure. Um, efforts that are happening right now, of course, fueled by the significant in input of additional federal dollars through the bipartisan infrastructure law. So the Clean Water Fund, which I'm hoping everybody's pretty familiar with already, but I wanna do a couple quick reminders about how that ties in with the stormwater work that I'm guessing most everybody on the, on the meeting here today um, does. I'm assuming again, the basics of how this works is understood to folks. We have two state revolving funds, actually, the Safe Drinking Water Loan Program and then the Clean Water Fund. Lots of uh, ways in which dollars come in and out of there. It's a revolving fund, but we um, mostly mostly give out loans for water infrastructure projects. Um, some principal forgiveness, which feels a little bit more like a grant for those that are eligible. And there's more principal forgiveness money now under bipartisan infrastructure law than there was historically. So that's great. Um, so again, just quick over here, assuming folks know this background. I just wanted to cover and here again, background um, on how these, uh, these subsidized rates work across different uh, kind of categories or tiers of where you land as a municipality. Hey, Ezra, we need to wrap it up soon. Okay. Okay. I only have a few minutes left. Thank you, Miriam. Skipping the numbers here, but big infusion of BIL dollars. It, I know that, so we, we reach out very regularly to wastewater and drinking water, but stormwater often gets left out. And this, and this want to really make sure to reach this audience today. Um, 
you didn't know that stormwater is an eligible, you know, area for for application for these funds through the the Clean Water Fund. Maybe that's your biggest takeaway from today. I hope, but uh, it is also important this sort of a uh, reality. Last year, fiscal year 2024, we had it for the first time in a long time. We had applications in excess of available dollars in both programs, and so um, it's highly competitive. It probably isn't too surprising, but even though we have a lot more money to spend, we also have a lot more, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot more interest and a lot more applications coming in. So get your applications in early is the most important uh, bottom line note there. That's all saying get get your applications in early. That's the biggest takeaway. We, we're gonna have we're gonna have dollars again next year, but this last year was really competitive, and not everybody will likely land a loan or principal forgiveness if they're eligible. Here's the deadlines on that. All this will be in their talk, so you can definitely follow up if this is something you want to look at more. Um, I'm going to skip over technical assistance, but know if you don't already know that there's a lot of technical assistance available, both in state here at the DNR and, and some other agencies, but also from a bunch of other providers that are operating either regionally or even nationally. EPA has a single sort of portal to connect with that, so those, that, those details are right there on the screen, water TA. Stormwater projects and how they fit in. So I'm going to skip a few slides here just to get to some reminders about using the latest data, which of course probably everyone here is, doesn't need that reminder. But um, this, you know, we're trying to connect you with and make sure everyone's aware of this great information from Wiki. So and and others that have taken Wiki data to make it even more um, user friendly and, and usable by folks. So there's this downscaled GIS climate modeling data that's available for folks in Wisconsin from the state cartographer's office. Follow that link if you want to know more about that. Lots of other resources on both technical assistance and funding that will be in the in the uh, PDF. So take a look there if any of this is relevant to you. <clears throat> Stormwater projects are eligible. As I noted, um, it's got to be water quality focused because this is a water quality funding program. But um, as you can see about eligibility there at the bottom, there's a lot of uh, different aspects of projects that are that are eligible potentially if this is a kind of financing that might work for your municipality or for your utility. Some more details there on eligible projects and what's not eligible. In the last year or so, um, we've had a few stormwater staff that are funded by, you know, funded, um, by the bipartisan infrastructure law that have been able to really dig in on this and try to help streamline <clears throat> the whole application process for stormwater applicants. So. Got your own web page here on stormwater at the state revolving fund web page. <clears throat> Excuse me, and some hand, uh, handouts, fact sheets, and uh, other documents that can be really helpful on connecting with that and being able to get through that application process, hopefully without too much blood, sweat, and tears, and uh, get those applications in. So we're really hoping that we'll see more and more stormwater projects coming in for Clean Water Fund. Um, in the remaining years of the bipartisan infrastructure law, certainly, and uh, and even beyond. There's my thank you and DNR contact stuff. And then here's, as I promised, info for all three of us and how to join an infrastructure working group. Well, thank you very much. We have about three minutes left uh, for the round table discussion. Did the three of you want to um, talk about anything further or as a, as a group, or have you pretty much covered all the subjects you wanted to cover? Yeah, I think we covered everything pretty well in my opinion, Leif. Um, there are a couple of questions, uh, one in the chat and then one I just answered uh, a question um, uh, in the Q and A. Um, and I'll just uh, um, read that out. Uh, given the rapid rate of climate change, how concerned should stormwater engineers be about sizing stormwater infrastructure, ponds, culverts, storm sewer, et cetera, based on the current standards. Um, and uh, my response is, at least my opinion is that uh, both infrastructure owners and stormwater engineers alike should have a healthy concern. Um, most uh, stormwater engineers are likely gonna be asking that infrastructure owner, um, you know, putting the onus on that infrastructure owner, are, you know, what do you wanna have it sized for? Do you wanna have it, you know, to just, just put in the same size that's there that just blew out? Um, or do we wanna um, size it to, to current DNR standards? Or do we wanna talk about uh, you know, what, we've, what we think are the, the projected uh, um, uh, 
you know, amounts, events that might happen during the design life of that infrastructure. And again, my my hope is that most uh, infrastructure owners are are concerned about the the entire projected design life rather than just today's uh, um, current standards, which we know are inadequate. When when is Atlas Fifteen due? Is it like two years? Two years, twenty twenty six. It's hope 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 to come out. Um, yeah, again, soon, soon, but don't hold your breath. Right, is what I've heard. <laughs> I just a note on what on Rick, what you were just answering too. I just talked yesterday with our stormwater section manager, um, Shannon Dobbins Hayden, who some may, may know, and um, she wanted to she wanted me to emphasize that we've got our um, mostly water quality based um, standards and requirements in NR216 and in, and in NR151. But there, uh, as far as design storms and perhaps choosing a bigger design storm for the future to help prevent flooding in light of all the way that precipitation is changing, et cetera, the um, statutes allow local law to do that, to go above and beyond where we're at at, at DNR and focus on volume, focus on on quantity. So, um, you know, many, may, some of you likely have probably already done that, I'm gonna guess, but um, there is certainly room there for local, um, you know, going for farther under current state laws. I know that from uh, in my case, the county's perspective, uh, when we last redid our ordinance, we referred to Atlas 14. And, you know, it'd be good to try and stay current, but we need to have something to point to that, um, you know, is a, an authoritative number. And I don't really see us changing until Atlas 15 comes out, and then we'll presumably update our ordinance to say, oh, by the way, the standard has changed. I think the DNR is in the same boat. I mean, I know we, you know, the, with this incredible rich data from Wiki, you know, I sit here wondering, is there any chance that somebody could grab a hold of some of that data and go further faster before we get Atlas 15? But, you know, also in checking with, with other folks around different parts of the department, I think, you know, most of us are waiting for Atlas 15. Well, we're at our designated quitting time. So I'm gonna say thank you, the three of you very much for the excellent presentations you put together and also to all our other presenters who uh, worked really hard to make interesting and valuable contributions. So thank you, thank you all. And thanks to the audience for tuning in. Uh, again, you'll be receiving an email from Wisconsin Land and Water that will contain a survey and even if you don't need it for um, PDHs, uh, we hope you'll fill it out anyways because we really value the feedback and in particular suggestions for future presentations or presenters. Um, I always rack my brains or our group racks our brains every every fall thinking about who, who would make good, present, pres <laughs> good presenters or interesting presentations and uh, we really, one of the first things we look at is the audience suggestions from the workshop. Um, so I think that is pretty much it. Uh, Wisconsin Land and Water is going to be posting videos of these presentations on their YouTube channel. I believe a link to that will be in the email that you get. And also we'll be putting PDF copies of uh, the presentations on the county website. Um, so I think that's pretty much it. So thanks again. And I hope to see you again next, uh, probably April, at the next uh, iteration of this workshop. So uh, I hope you have a good summer and we'll see you again soon.